the most expensive stuff in the universe. Oh! Yeah, grandiose. It's called antimatter. Its existence was first theorized in 1930 when the electron was discovered. Scientists thought it might mean the exact opposite should exist too, and they call this hypothetical particle positron. Later, antipods of other elementary particles, protons and neutrons, were proven to exist as well. Morons came later. <laughs> when a particle and its evil twin collide with each other, they disappear, releasing literally tons of energy, 10,000 times more than a nuclear reaction does. But there's a catch. It takes about 100 billion years to create just one gram of antimatter. And it can only be created using the Large Hadron Collider. That's why the cost of this substance is about 62 trillion bucks. And we're not even close to getting that much. Throughout the entire history of space observation, only two objects from another star system, or maybe even another galaxy, have entered our solar system. The first one was the Oumuamua asteroid, discovered in 2017. The second was Borisov a comet found in August 2019. The cloud of dust that surrounds it allows scientists to learn more about substances that may have come to us from another galaxy. An unusual teardrop-shaped star was found. It has almost twice the mass of the Sun and looks like a big drop of lava because of the dwarf star hanging out nearby. The little buddy attracts the energy of its big brother and distorts its surface. Black holes can do that too. There's a star about 215 million light-years away from us that got spaghettified because of the gravity of a black hole nearby. Astronomers on Earth had to use dozens of telescopes to register the event. In the end, they saw a black hole gobbling up a star, which stretched until it became a thin ray of matter. As it was eating, the hole also ejected billions of tons of star material into space. About 250 million light-years away, though, there's a miraculous survival story. In 2020, a red giant came too close to a massive black hole, 400,000 times heavier than the Sun, and got caught in its gravitational pull. Normally, this means there's no escape. Once a black hole catches something, it will never let go of its prey. In this case, the star somehow managed to get away. Most of its outer layers were slurped away by the hungry black beast, leaving behind only the molten core, a white dwarf. And using this loss of mass, it ripped itself from the black hole's tug and started circling it at an ever-increasing orbit. Scientists are sure the white dwarf is still imprisoned forever, though, because the hole continues to chip away at it even as it gets further. In the end, the star will cool down and become a planet that looks much like Jupiter. But that might only happen in about a trillion years. I won't be around then. And much longer than the universe has been around so far. It was proved that a planet can orbit a black hole as it would a star. The energy from the hole would feed such a planet. But to survive in such conditions and not be pumped inside the event horizon, the planet must orbit very quickly at nearly the speed of light, and the black hole itself must spin at the same speed. I can't but imagine what kind of life it would be on such a planet. Um, fast? Earthquakes on the moon, or shall I say earthquakes, aren't something from science fiction. They don't occur as often as on our planet. And when they do, it happens closer to the center of the satellite. Scientists think moon quakes might be caused by the gravity of Earth and the Sun. There are Mars quakes, too. For a long time, the red planet had been considered tectonically inactive. But more recent observations have shown it still has weak quakes from time to time. You probably wouldn't even be able to feel them if you stood on Mars' surface. But it means some geological processes are still going on underneath the red and dusty landscape. At a distance of 640 light-years from the Sun, scientists discovered the planet WASP-76b, where it rains iron. The planet is very close to its Sun and always turned to it with the same side. The term is tidally lie. The temperature on the sunny side is so high that metals melt and evaporate there. The other half of the planet is cool enough that metals condense again and fall down as rain. 
Speaking of tidal locks, our moon is the same way. There's no dark side to our satellite, it's just always turned to us with one side. When the moon happens to be in between the Earth and the sun, what we call its dark side becomes brightly lit. We just can't see it from our planet. <laughs> Figures. Turns out there are plenty of planets in the universe, and even in the Milky Way galaxy, that have liquid or frozen water on them. The closest one is within our solar system. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Scientists are almost sure that underneath its frozen surface, there's an actual ocean of water. But it's too soon to be hyped about possible life on other planets. Liquid water is only one of many things that have to come together for life to appear on a planet. In fact, there's a place millions of light years away where there's a whole floating space cloud made entirely of water. There's so much of it that it could fill all of our oceans 140 trillion times over. Slightly more than what we need. Water on Earth is actually a puzzle shrouded in mystery and covered with riddles. The most popular theory is that it was brought to our planet by icy comets and asteroids that left behind not only mighty craters, but the liquid substance thanks to which we can now thrive. But in space, there's a whole lot of organic matter, and under specific conditions, it could yield so much water, it would be enough to fill our oceans a thousand times over. Researchers conducted an experiment in which they heated this organic matter and obtained clear water and oil. If this is confirmed in future studies, it could mean that even oil appeared on Earth not only thanks to fossilized remains of living beings, but came from outer space as well. And yet, there just might be about 6 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone. The latest data has shown that every fifth sun-like star can have at least one planet in its habitable zone. And not just any planet, mind you. It has a rocky core and surface, and it's of a comparable size to the Earth. Being inside the habitable zone of a star, such a planet would have high chances of becoming home to living creatures. Microbes, at least. And if there are billions of these planets in our galaxy, you could safely say that at least one of them is not only inhabitable, but inhabited already. And now, multiply this by the number of galaxies in the universe, also considering that many of them are much bigger than the Milky Way. This gives us billions upon billions of sun-like stars and Earth-like planets, and some of them are surely more like ours than others. Until recently, we thought our galaxy looked like a circular spiral. But recent research has shown it looks more like a Pringles chip. Scientists measured the distances between the Sun and other stars and created a three-dimensional map of the Milky Way based on this data. It turned out that our galaxy is slightly curved at the edges and takes an S-shape. At this, we might be able to walk upright because of supernova explosions. About 2.5 million years ago, a supernova sent cosmic rays to our planet. They triggered a series of electrical storms in the Earth's atmosphere, which turned into thunderstorms. Those in their turn caused wildfires in Northeast Africa, where our earlier ancestors lived. Fires turned the forest area into a savanna, the atmospheric pressure changed, and our ancestors had to stand on two legs to survive. The biggest explosion since the Big Bang was registered in 2019. This happened in the Aphiochus Cluster which unites thousands of galaxies. According to scientists, the blast was equal to 20 billion billion, that's 18 zeros, megaton explosions happening once a millisecond for 240 million years. Eh, I'll have to trust that. My math is not that good. Remember the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs on Earth? Who could forget? There might have been another space show that ended badly for at least 75% of all life on our planet in the past. Roughly 360 million years ago, a supernova explosion occurred about 65 light years away from us, and the cosmic rays sent by it swept away the ozone layer of our pretty blue ball. If it had been any closer, all life could have easily been gone. Right now, the greatest threat for us comes in the form of Betelgeuse, not the movie, but a giant star about 600 light-years away. If it explodes into a supernova, 
we'll see it with unaided eyes even during the day. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all. Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? If you've watched the movie Alien, then you know the answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut, though, if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero, when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions. Like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first! Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, but something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it, it's completely normal. The truth of the matter is, you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity, NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit. 
while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse, and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So, you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe, and boil. Yikes! How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads. And we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now, imagine living like that for six months or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way, their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much. They do need to keep hydrated, though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak or barbecue sauce. Now, as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy, and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryo bed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? Have you heard about a diamond star that could put all the riches on Earth to shame? Or how about twinkling stars with surfaces made of solid iron? So let's take a look at these weird stars and try to unravel their mysteries. There's a star in the Centaurus constellation that was nicknamed Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yes, it was named after a Beatles song because it basically is a Beatles song, you see. The star was discovered to have a massive diamond at its core. Now, you may be wondering how big this diamond really is. Well, it's estimated to be about 10 billion trillion trillion carats. That's a one followed by 34 zeros. To put that into perspective, the Hope Diamond, which is one of the largest diamonds on Earth, is a measly 45.5 carats in comparison. Can you imagine the size of the ring you could make with this star diamond? And it's about the same mass as our sun. But don't get too excited about the prospect of owning this diamond just yet. Even if you were Jeff Bezos, you wouldn't be able to afford it. According to Ronald Winston, CEO of Harry Winston Inc., the diamond is so big that it would likely depress the value of the market. So, you'd have to settle for a much smaller diamond engagement ring. 
One interesting thing about the Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds star is that it's incredibly dense. In fact, it has the mass of the Sun crammed into an object only a third the diameter of Earth. That's like trying to fit an elephant into a shoebox. And yet, despite its massive size, it's actually quite cool, with a core temperature of only about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, the core temperature of our Sun is about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Since the discovery of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, several other crystallized stars have been found, some with diamond hearts the size of Earth. It just goes to show that the universe is full of surprises, and you never know what kind of treasures you might find out there in the vast expanse of space. And this isn't the only weird star we've discovered so far. There are many strange, unexplained things in outer space. For example, let's take Vega. Vega, also known as Alpha Lyrae, is a bright star located in the constellation Lyra. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky and is easily visible to the naked eye from most parts of the world. Now, Vega may look like a beautiful, bright star to us Northern Hemisphere folks, but little do we know, it's hiding a secret. It's actually quite squashed. You see, Vega's high spin rate causes it to bulge at the equator, kind of like a cosmic belly. It rotates once every 12.5 hours, which is pretty fast for a star, and it throws material out around its waistline. It's almost like the star is hula hooping. This material is further from the center of the star, so it experiences less gravity, causing it to cool and darken, leading to a gravity darkening effect. So Vega is basically a cosmic fitness guru's worst nightmare. Although for us stargazers, it still looks round because we're looking at it from Earth's pole end. However, if we saw it from a different angle, we'd get a very different view. One that might make us wonder if Vega has been sneaking some cosmic donuts behind our backs. But while we might joke about its equatorial waistline, there's no denying that Vega is still one of the brightest and most fascinating stars in our galaxy. But if you want something actually bright, then how about a supernova? Supernovas are giant space booms that occur when stars reach the end of their life cycle. It's like the grand finale of a fireworks show, but on a cosmic scale. They release more energy in a few seconds than our sun will produce in its entire lifetime. And this is exactly what happened to the next star of our show. This celestial object with a weird name, IPFT14HLS. But there's a catch. It isn't your average supernova. Even though this star made a blast in 2014 and started to fade away like usual, recently it made an unexpected comeback and brightened once more. <laughs> Talk about a dramatic entrance. And if that wasn't enough, this thing continued to fade and brighten at least five times in total, which is a bit like a yo-yo. It's like the star just couldn't make up its mind about whether it wanted to stay bright or fade away into the abyss. Also, when scientists measured the supernova's spectrum, they found that it was evolving 10 times slower than other stars. Maybe it's a supernova that just wants to enjoy its golden years. All in all, this object is a real mystery. But this is not the only star suffering from the two-in-one syndrome. At first glance, M.Y. Camelopardalis appears to be a fairly common star. But after a closer look, astronomers concluded it was actually two stars in one. These two stars are orbiting each other at over 600,000 miles per hour. It's a contact binary star system, which means that the stars are so close together that they share a common envelope. In other words, they're so close to each other that they're practically smooching. These celestial Romeo and Juliet are one of the most massive known binary stars out there. 
Each of them individually weighs in at a whopping 32 and 38 solar masses, respectively. Astronomers also think that they might be on the brink of a stellar merger, which means that one day, they might just combine into one giant superstar. Wow, who knew space could be so romantic? Next, introducing another long name, HD 140283, also known as Methuselah's star. This little guy in the constellation Libra has been around for a while, and by a while, I mean a really long time. Actually, scientists used to think it was older than the universe itself. Just imagine if it turned out to be true. But eventually, they figured out that it's actually around 14.8 billion years old, a peer of our universe. That's still pretty impressive, though. This star is so old, it remembers when the Milky Way was just a baby galaxy. But despite all that, this star still has some life left in it. It's just starting to expand into a red giant, which is kind of like when you hit your 30s. Talk about aging well. But if all these things are somewhat comprehensible, then how about a star that was literally named WTF star by scientists? No, I'm not kidding. At least it used to be. Now it's called Tabby's star. It also has a more scientific name, but that one is a bit of a mouthful. But what's really bizarre about this star is its irregular dimming. For some reason, it doesn't glow like a normal star, but blinks, as if someone turned on and off a flashlight. And it's not just a little dip, we're talking up to a 22% drop in light. So it's not because it sometimes gets blocked by a planet or something. Scientists have come up with all sorts of explanations for this strange behavior, from comets to dust to even an extraterrestrial megastructure. That's right, but before your imagination runs too wild, it's important to note that the most likely explanation is just plain old dust. Perhaps the star is surrounded by some kind of dust cloud, and sometimes it prevents us from seeing it clearly. Although this explanation is still not 100% confirmed, there are still plenty of mysteries surrounding Tabby's star. One thing's for sure, it may be a bit of an oddball, but that's what makes it so fascinating. So, there you have it, folks. We're left in awe of the incredible diversity and strangeness of the cosmos. There's so much more to discover out there. So, let's keep exploring and keep being amazed by the wonders of the universe. Aristotle once said that gold was water solidified in the ground and mixed with the sun's rays. Others were sure that gold was made with the help of the Philosopher's Stone. When the ancient Incas first saw gold, they decided that this metal, falling from the sky, was the tears of a mythical creature. But its real origin seems much more epic. Let's go to a very distant past, to the time when there were no people or animals, to the time when dinosaurs didn't exist yet, to the era when the simplest forms of life were just being formed. Our planet resembled a huge cauldron of chemical elements. There were erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, and lightning flashes all the time. It was about 3.9 billion years ago. During this period, huge asteroids flew through our solar system. They fell on Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. It's possible that asteroids also fell on the moon and left large craters on it. There was a real apocalypse on our planet. But fortunately, no one felt it because there was no life yet. Along with the destruction, the asteroids brought metals. But were there metals on Earth before that? Of course. The core of our planet is mainly made up of metals such as iron. From there, it spreads to Earth's crust mixes with magma, comes into contact with oxygen, and combines with other elements. But how did they get into the core? Simple hydrogen and helium atoms merged and formed heavier elements inside giant stars. Then, supernovae exploded and formed big clouds of dust and gas. These clouds reached our galaxy and began to revolve around the sun. Over time, 
This dust and the remnants of stars formed planets. One of them was our Earth. Metals lying in the bowels of our planet are difficult to get. And we wouldn't have the technology we have now if it wasn't for that meteor shower that left metals on Earth's surface. There are two theories. The first suggests that powerful supernova explosions far from our universe formed a lot of metals from the periodic table. During the explosion, nuclear fusion started, and it created atoms of gold. Then the blast wave threw those hot pieces in different directions. They flew for a long time, cooled down in cold space, and reached our solar system. Another theory says that gold and other metals appeared because of the merger of two neutron stars. These are powerful giant stars that are many times smaller in size than the Sun, but several times heavier than it. These are objects with tremendous gravitational force and density. Their collision formed an intense gamma-ray burst of radiation that could synthesize gold. In 2017, Astrophysicists observed the collision of two neutron stars for the first time. They found traces of heavy metals, including gold, using gravitational wave detectors. So this theory seems more likely. And what if we go even further? Where did stars come from? Clouds of dust and gas are scattered throughout the universe. They mix, combine into one mass, and grow like a snowball. They squeeze each other and form a gravitational force. When all the material collapses, it starts to heat up. And then this surge of energy creates a star. Some physicists assume that stars, during their lifetime, can produce most of the elements of the periodic table. If this theory is true, then our body also consists of stars. We may be part of some gigantic supernova that exploded billions of years ago at the other end of the universe. More than 50 years have passed since the appearance of this theory, but no one has proved or disproved it. Okay, let's get back to gold. One of the largest gold deposits in the world is in southern Africa. Scientists believe that the precious metal appeared there more than two billion years ago after the fall of a giant meteorite. People are sure that gold is hidden in the world's oceans. Anywhere from 10 to 20 million tons of this precious metal can be underwater. But those are not large stones, but tiny particles dissolved in liquid. The extraction of such gold is too expensive. Now, let's find out how people mine gold and turn it into jewelry. At first, people find gold deposits large plots of land or rock inside which gold is hidden. Workers begin to use picks, shovels, and machines to extract shiny pieces from the rock. Then these pieces are dissolved in a special acid that separates the gold from the solids. After that, other substances get removed from the precious metal by melting or using gaseous flora. When the gold is purified, it's checked for purity. 99.9% .9 is the benchmark. Done your gold is ready to use. You can turn it into jewelry or part of an electronic device. The rarest metals on Earth also got here from stars. I'm talking about rhodium and iridium. They are several times more expensive than gold, not because of their beauty, but because of their practical value. For example, rhodium and iridium can turn harmful gases into harmless ones, and 90% of the demand for this metal falls on the automaker's market. People use these metals in the manufacturing of auto catalysts. They are needed to clean harmful exhaust. When toxic substances produced during fuel combustion come into contact with these precious metals, they become their safer forms. A micro layer of rhodium and iridium is applied to the walls of the catalyst cylinder. Gold, platinum, rhodium, and iridium are the most expensive metals. But what about the most durable ones? It's a little complicated to determine one winner because the strength of a metal depends on four criteria. First, there's tensile strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist tearing. For example, modeling clay has a low tensile strength because you can easily stretch it in different directions. Among metals, 
tungsten is perhaps the most difficult to stretch. Another criterion is compressive strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist compression. And here, chrome is one of the strongest. The third criterion for the strength of metals is yield strength. To test this, you need to make a rod or beam from any metal and then try to bend it and break it. The metal that shows the greatest resistance has a high yield strength level. And titanium is pretty good for that. And the fourth criterion is impact strength. This shows how strong the metal is when it gets dropped or hit. In this regard, iron shows a good result. Each metal has its own strong and weak sides. Chrome, for example, has a high resistance to compression, but it's weak if you try to stretch it. Therefore, people make metal alloys to combine their strengths. Okay, we've learned about the rarest and most expensive metals. And what about other elements? What's the rarest substance in the world? Meet astatine, the rarest element on the planet. There are about 0.8 ounces of this substance found in the whole world. The rate of its decay is equal to the speed of its formation. Therefore, the amount of the substance in nature doesn't change. People discussed it in the 1800s and discovered it at the end of the 19th century. But even now, after so many years, we know little about this element. In 1869, the creator of the periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev, learned that there was a certain substance numbered 85 in the group of halogen elements. This group of non-metals includes such substances as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So astatine is considered the heaviest of all known halogens and most similar to metals. It has a low melting point and conducts heat and electricity poorly. It's brittle in solid form and has a dark color. Even today, scientists don't know all its properties. It's almost impossible to find it in nature, but chemists have learned to synthesize it artificially. People don't know how to use this element because it's too radioactive. But in some laboratories, scientists conduct experiments using astacine to treat thyroid diseases. No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them, and some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, 
it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know about such things as pulsars. So Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the moon flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the moon. The side that we never see because the moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously, and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months, but fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. 
And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe – a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into soundtracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. Now, did you know that there's an astronomical object in which space and time actually swap places? How does that work? And what exactly does swapping space and time mean? Well, let's figure it out. Imagine that you're on a spacecraft. The vehicle can only move straight. Your path leads to some inevitable point, and you have no idea what lies ahead. You can only hope that it won't be too bad. Meanwhile, everything around you is complete madness. A chaotic collage of many historical events. What do you see? Ancient humans and dinosaurs? The birth of the universe? A uh, future? Who knows? That's what the universe would look like if we swapped time and space. And theoretically, this is what you would see if you fell into a black hole and somehow were able to survive. But how is something like this even possible? First of all, let's discuss time and space. Imagine drawing a light bulb on a sheet of paper. Then grab one more sheet and draw how it lit up. Right now, it's just a small circle of light. Another sheet? The circle of light is growing. It gets bigger and bigger in size, until finally, it turns into a giant circle. In real life, the bulb lights up in the blink of an eye. That's because the speed of light is the fastest in the universe. But here, on our drawings, we capture the propagation of light frame by frame. We see how, over time, the light has grown from a small dot to a large circle. But if you connect these circles, doesn't it remind you of some shape? For example, a cone? Yes, exactly! This is called a light cone, and time is the central axis of this cone. Why? Because light turns from a small dot into a large circle over time. To remember it, let's draw a time vector, an arrow inside the cone. It goes from the past to the future. Meanwhile, the circles are space. In space, we can move however we want, in any direction. We can move up or down, in zigzags and so on. But no matter what zigzags we draw, along the timeline, we're always moving forward. We can't turn back in time, and we can't stop it. This helps us define time and space. Time is the direction in which the light cone is oriented. This is the direction where all our paths lead, and where our future inevitably lies. And space is the whole variety of directions perpendicular to the timeline. This is a straightforward graph. If it could be applied to the entire universe, then time would flow the same everywhere. However, if you've watched at least some popular sci-fi movies, you know that this isn't the case. In reality, time can be crazy. For example, if you're chilling near a black hole, what will be two hours for you may turn out to be 20 years for your friend on Earth. But why? Well, take a deep breath. Now gravity comes into play. Oh, I know about gravity. It's that thing that helps me to stand on the ground, you may think. But it's much, much more complicated than that. Gravity is one of the basic physical forces in our world, and it's incredibly powerful. In fact, she's such a girl boss that she can distort space and time. She can literally influence the speed of time like an almighty wizard. How? Well, let's take something slightly bigger than a light bulb. For example, a supernova. 
Somewhere in the universe, a star has just made a boom. How do we know about it? Well, nothing in the universe, no sound, no radio waves, nothing, travels faster than light. So we'll know about the birth of a supernova only when we see it. And this will happen only when its light cone grows enough and reaches our planet. So the light cone grows and grows. So far, everything is fine. And finally, it reaches our planet. But there's a catch. You see, our planet is very massive, very massive, and it has pretty strong gravity. What happens then? Gravity changes the direction of the light cone. It begins to attract the cone to the center of our planet. And with it, it also attracts our arrow of time. That means it slows the time down. And the closer the light cone is to us, the more the arrow bends and the slower time goes. What does it mean? Well, for example, the fact that the watch on your ankle will lag behind the watch on your wrist, that your head is aging faster than your legs, and that astronauts in Earth's orbit age a little slower than people on Earth. This is what scientists call general relativity. Right. But how does this relate to our topic? How can we understand what will happen if we swap space and time? Nah, don't worry, we're almost there. Now, imagine a cosmic body with incredibly strong gravity. It bends time and space so much that it feels like they swap. This is a black hole. A black hole attracts absolutely everything to its center. No stars, planets, no light can escape from there. Let's say our light cone is approaching it. First, as usual, time begins to bend toward the center of the black hole, attracted by its gravity. But the gravity is very strong, so it bends more and more. And time goes slower and slower the closer you're to the center. In the end, the light cone crosses the boundary of the black hole the so-called event horizon. At this point, it gets so distorted that now it's literally pointing downwards. We can say that time has changed its direction. Time is pointing downwards. What kind of nonsense is that, you may ask? It'll be easier to explain in a real example. Imagine you're a crazy astronaut who decided to jump into a black hole. And there's an observer in the spaceship who watches you doing this for some reason. At first, for you, nothing changes. You look at your watch, you see that 5 minutes have passed, and everything's okay. But for the observer, first of all, you'll fall for a very long time. The observer has been sitting there for 50 years, and you're still falling. All because your time has slowed down. Secondly, since space is also distorted near the black hole, the observer will see how you'll begin to stretch like spaghetti. This is a scientific term, by the way. It's called spaghettification. And then you finally cross the event horizon. The observer doesn't see you anymore. Light cannot escape from a black hole, so your image won't reach the observer even if you're still inside. And what about you? What if you somehow survived? Remember, the time arrow is pointing to the center of the black hole. What does it mean? It means that now, the center of the black hole is your future. It isn't a place, it's a fate that you can't change. And wherever you came from, as well as the rest of the universe, no longer exists for you. Because now, it's not a place, but an event from the past. And since you can't turn back time, you'll never be able to come back. But what is around you? Complete chaos. The rays of light now move in all directions, forward, backward, and so on. The rays depicting the events of the past, the future, the present, all this is moving around you. In reality, space and time didn't swap places, but it feels like they did. Because in space, you can now only move forward, as if along a straight line. And time, reflected in the light rays, surrounds you everywhere and moves in all possible directions. And here we go back to the beginning. This horrifying example helps us imagine what it would feel like if time and space got reversed. Of course, all this is just theories and guesses. The very idea that we're moving in some one direction, the one we haven't chosen, and there's complete time chaos around, sounds quite frightening. And yet, it would be a very interesting experience. Sounds dangerous. Mm, Why don't you go first? It's raining cats and dogs, literally. Things falling down from the sky can be pretty unexpected. So here are some examples. 
Residents of Texarkana, Texas, once had light rain and fish shower. No need to go fishing out in the sea. The fish literally falls down on your head. In fact, animal rains are not uncommon. Water spouts or updrafts occurring in different corners of the earth sometimes carry small creatures up with them. Those could be crabs, frogs, or indeed, fish. A water spout is generally a whirlwind that picks up water and grows in size until it connects the surface of the water and the clouds. Lightweight critters living close to the water surface often get caught in the vortex and carried up and away. Thunderstorm clouds are constant companions of water spouts too. When the storm reaches a landmass, it starts slowing down, having nowhere to take the new energy from. It slowly subsides, the atmospheric pressure drops, and the thunderclouds release the water in them, along with the unfortunate small animals and fish. Sometimes it's just a few frogs frozen from the cold up above, but at other times it could be hundreds or thousands of creatures raining down upon the land. A much more unusual rain once happened in Oakville, Washington, and it's still waiting for someone to explain it. The rain clouds looked perfectly normal, but the rain they released was anything but. Translucent jelly-like blobs fell on the town, covering a total area of about 20 square miles. Each of them wasn't larger than a grain of rice. Researchers who studied these raindrops claimed that the gooey blobs contained human white blood cells. Some believe they might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain or waste from a commercial airplane. Now this kind of rain is what I'd like to see someday, a money shower. One such event occurred in a small town in Germany. A woman was driving when she suddenly saw banknotes swirling down from the sky, so she hit the brakes. She went out of her car and later said she managed to collect quite a large amount of money. After which, as any responsible citizen should, she turned it over to the police. Strangely, when the officers came back to the scene with the woman, they couldn't find any more cash, although she claimed she hadn't been able to collect everything. There's still no explanation for the event, but certainly, no water spout could have caused that. A pretty unpleasant kind of rain happened back in 1876 in Olympia Springs, Kentucky. It was a very local kind, too. Mrs. Crouch said that she had been making soap outside her home when pieces of raw meat suddenly started falling down from the sky around her. Some of those chunks were pretty massive, reaching over three inches in diameter. Local newspapers reported that two people who decided to remain unknown tasted the meat and concluded it was mutton or venison. Months later, scientists decided to find out the truth behind the strange event. It became a matter of heated debate until one of the researchers came up with the most reasonable conclusion. The meat rain must have been caused by vultures flying over the town at the time. These birds sometimes regurgitate food right in the middle of their flight as a defense mechanism, or to make their bodies lighter to fly faster. And that must have been what happened right over Mrs. Crouch's house, unfortunately. Something totally inedible, but no less sinister, rained down on several villages in India in the middle of May of 2022. Huge black and silver metal balls started dropping from the sky, the first one weighing over 15 pounds. Astounded residents watched in shock as it hammered the ground, scattering pieces of itself across the nearby fields. Similar balls later fell in the other two neighboring villages. Luckily, no one was harmed during the strange metal rain. But the issue remained. We're on Earth, and it usually rains water here. The local authorities weren't sure what it was about, but astronomers soon voiced a theory that it could be debris from a space rocket. One that fits the description had launched in September of 2021, aiming to put a communication satellite into orbit. Upon its re-entry into the atmosphere, it might have been damaged, causing several chunks of it to detach and fall down on the ground in India. Sometimes it rains birds, too. One such event occurred in Arkansas in 2010. Weather conditions might cause things like that to happen, but there are simpler reasons, too. Loud noise and confusion, or even collisions with aircraft. In the case of Arkansas, it was the noise and flashing lights from the New Year's Eve fireworks. The show startled thousands of birds and made them start into the air. They were panicking and disoriented, so they collided with buildings, cars, and trees. 
Many of them eventually fell to the ground, making lots of people believe it was actually raining birds. Now, if anything could startle me out in the sky, it's a rain of spiders. And if you wonder whether it's a real thing, well, yes, it is. In Australia, spider rains actually happen quite often. They even have a name for this, ballooning. It goes like this. Spiders that can balloon climb up trees and tall bushes, trying to reach the highest point available in the area. When they've climbed up to the very top, they spin their web in such a way that it allows them to be carried by the wind. And there it goes, clutching the strands of the web with its tiny little feet. The brave spider lifts off into the air and flies to whatever awaits it out there. Normally, ballooning goes unnoticed by us humans because spiders don't travel in large groups. You might have a shocking experience when a spider suddenly lands on your face out of nowhere, but otherwise, it's a rare occasion to meet more than two ballooners at once. Still, when the weather gets particularly bad, with lots of rain or wind, thousands or even millions of spiders might decide it's time to move to somewhere friendlier and take to the sky all at once. That's when spider rains occur. Those who witnessed the most recent ones back in 2012 and 2015 say it looks like a snowfall, spiders slowly drifting down on their web parachutes that settle on the ground and turn it white. Remember water spouts? Well, those things can lift not only fish and frogs into the sky and make a spectacular show of them falling back on the ground. Golf balls sometimes become their cargo too. And I'm not speaking of golf ball-sized hail, but actual balls. The town of Punta Gorda in Florida witnessed a rain of golf balls in 1969. Newspapers reported dozens upon dozens of those things pummeling the ground and buildings for a short while. Since it's a coastal town with lots of golf courses, it wasn't hard to explain the event. A water spout must have formed near the shore, traveled to some course, grabbed a few dozen golf balls, and then released them over the town. Rain can be pretty refreshing, as long as it's not mud rain. On April 12, 1902, the town of Easton, Philadelphia experienced an unusual shower. It made all those unfortunate enough to go outside take an actual shower and wash their clothes to boot. The raindrops looked dirty to the eye, and they were. People, buildings, and streets looked really wanting to take a good bath after it stopped pouring. The witnesses reported a considerable amount of dust in the air before the rain started, which probably explains the event. In 2011, a town in Scotland saw another weird rain variety. It was showered with worms. The rain didn't cover a large area. It seems only some local academy students were unlucky enough to get invertebrates falling on their heads while playing soccer. There was a significant change in the weather at the time, so scientists believe it might have resulted from some meteorological anomaly. The universe is not static. It evolves all the time and grows in all directions. It's expanding, and scientists found this out almost a century ago. And it's not at a stable rate. The more time goes by, the faster the universe expands. As this happens, stars, planets, and galaxies move farther and farther apart, which leaves more space between them. If that's the case, the universe is supposed to become colder as it expands, right? After all, it was a lot denser when the Big Bang happened and a lot hotter. As it was expanding, space was cooling down, which created conditions for planets, stars, and other space objects to form. Yeah, that's not exactly the case now. Scientists were surprised to hear it too, but our universe is actually getting hotter. They observed the temperature of cosmic gas farther away from our home planet compared to young gases closer to the Earth. Since we measure distance in space by light years, farther areas are like going back to the past, and regions closer to us are like observing the present day. They found out the temperature of a gas in space has gone up more than 10 times in the last 10 billion years. Now, the temperature of the cosmic gas that's spread all across the universe can get to around 4 million degrees Fahrenheit. Wow! As the universe expands, gravitational force does its part and pulls gas and dark matter together. It's doing some pretty hard work there. It creates galaxies and clusters of galaxies out of them. And this process is totally chaotic. It's so messy that more and more gas heats up as all of this is happening. 
Space was extremely hot when it was just forming, 13.7 billion years ago. What if it gets warm like that once again? Scientists are observing the situation. They found out the temperature in space increased by measuring cosmic gases using something called redshift. They generally use this method when they want to see how far away some space objects are. Those that are closer to us have shorter light wavelengths. The farther some object is, the longer its light wavelengths are. And they can now determine the temperature of a certain object from its light. On average, space is a pretty cold place. The glow that's left from the Big Bang is called the CMB, which is short for the Cosmic Microwave Background. It's so powerful and intense, it bathes the entire universe in light. It's the only thing that significantly heats up matter. But there are many smaller mechanisms that help to heat up matter in the universe. And they could go crazy if space warms up. Like stars, they emit radiation that affects nearby dust and gas. They radiate throughout the far infrared too. When a star is at its early stage, the radiation coming from it forms protoplanetary structures that look like disks. They primarily form in a single plane, and a bright central star produces spectacularly illuminated gas, and there are blue reflections of this gas. It was like that with our planetary system too. Strong energy and gravitational forces cause collisions, dust, and gas in an uncontrolled vortex that's forming planets. That's why most planets in our solar system orbit in the same direction. That's the direction this giant whirlpool was spinning a long time ago, too. Active stars, colliding galaxies, stellar cataclysms, black holes, neutron stars. The universe has so many sources of energy. And when you surround normal matter in space with such an energetic environment, it heats up drastically. When you heat something up, it radiates that energy away in a certain way. In most cases, galaxies have just a couple of areas where stars are forming, at regions where gas is collapsing. A bubble that surrounds that area contains ionized hydrogen. Three quarters of our sun is hydrogen. Thanks to that hydrogen, the sun keeps us warm. In its core, hydrogen transforms into helium and causes atomic fusion. Yep, that's how our sun releases its energy. Radiation heats all that gas to thousands and thousands of degrees. At the same time, it ionizes a large number of atoms and molecules, which basically means it turns them into ions. Atoms are neutral particles, and ions are either negatively or positively charged particles. If the universe heats up, our sun might too. If its temperature hits 30,000 degrees Kelvin, it could become hot enough to ionize all those materials it had previously ejected and it could create a real planetary nebula. This would be a nebula in the shape of a ring that forms because of an expanding gas that surrounds an aging star. As the temperature goes up all the time, hydrogen ionizes. At a few thousand degrees, this could turn the nebulae in our solar system pink with emission lines. Our sun could come to its end if it reaches the temperature of 50,000 degrees Kelvin. If you could float in space and come closer, you'd see it glow in eerie green tones because of doubly ionized oxygen. Higher energy phenomena make more galaxies collide. This heats gas even more and eventually results in X-ray emissions. What about black holes and radiating neutron stars? When they go crazy, they can shape whole galaxies and who knows what more. Maybe we'd have more masers too. Those are natural lasers our universe produces. They arise when big populations of molecules receive large amounts of energy. By now, scientists have found the strongest, yet the most distant, maser. So powerful, it's more luminous than the light 6,000 suns would produce, and in just one emission line. Maybe then we'd discover even stronger masers. That's in the case that we're even going to be here at all. Because as the universe is getting hotter, cosmic radiation is getting stronger not so good for life on Earth. Increased cosmic radiation could harm us. Who knows if life would even be possible on Earth in that case, or if the powerful gravitational force would pull our home planet too and crash it into another one. But maybe life as we know it wouldn't completely disappear. Or if that happened, it could possibly somehow find its way once again, maybe in the distant future. 
there's a possibility our universe could support life at its early stages. Doesn't look like that when you think of the chaos the Big Bang caused, right? But that was only in its mere beginnings. After things had settled down a bit, the dregs of enormous, earliest stars formed rocky planets. In our solar system, those are Earth, Mars, Mercury, and Venus. You can't set your foot on the rest of them, since they're gas giants. Back in that time, radiation was quite intense, so rocky planets had an adequate environment to form. Since it takes a lot of energy to whirlpool dust and particles and bake a planet in the end. This period of time coincides roughly with that when the first stars formed in our universe. Ancient stars were way bigger than our sun. They lived shorter though. They would have just exploded as supernovas on their end. And they would leave heavy metals across the space around them. Those are the particles rocky planets form from. Radiation spread around the whole universe back then. It has changed over time. Today, it's almost an absolute zero. 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when hydrogen atoms were forming, CMB was almost as hot as the surface of our sun. And about 15 million years after the Big Bang, its temperature was close to room temperature, which is around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. These things were happening across the universe, so there were many planets that could potentially hold life. If we were one of those ancient worlds, we wouldn't need a star to keep us warm. CMB would be enough to do it. So, it's possible that life in space is way older than we think it is. There could have been ancient worlds with liquid water on their surface. What if there were some primitive forms of organisms, like on our home planet a long time ago? Or even more developed ones? Perhaps we'll find out one day. Dust storms on Mars can really go crazy. They hurtle through the red planet's southern hemisphere, especially during the summer. These storms can grow and encompass large areas of the planet, as happened in January 2022. Then, a dust storm covered almost twice the area of the United States. Could it be something like this that caused one of the robots we sent to Mars to go missing? The atmosphere and climate are harsh on Mars. It's mostly a desert with strong winds and average temperatures of minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. It drops down to minus 220 at the poles during the winter. A lander needs to be specifically equipped and very sturdy to withstand such conditions. But researchers thought the Beagle 2 could handle the difficult trip to the Red Planet. June 3, 2003. A team of researchers got one of their pioneering robots they were about to send to space ready. It was a small and compact lander called the Beagle 2. Its mission was to touch down on Mars and search for what the world has been actively looking for for decades now – life on the Red Planet. Now, the touchdown was due on December 25th, but the signal never came. The team tried to contact the spaceship, but at one point, they had to accept they wouldn't be able to reach it. Some thought the landing was too difficult and complex after all, so the lander crashed. But they couldn't find any technical errors. Others had a theory that the lander may have become entangled in its own parachute and fell down to the surface of Mars. Either way, the Beagle 2 was considered missing until 2015, when NASA took pictures of what could be the remains of the lost lander. They weren't just smash debris, the components actually looked to be intact. The lander's remains were lying with its solar panels partially deployed around 3 miles away from the site where it was supposed to land. Apparently, the Beagle 2 managed to land successfully, but its radio antenna got blocked. That's why researchers couldn't control it from Earth or communicate with it. But no one knows exactly why it happened. Have you heard of a face on Mars? In the 1970s, one of NASA's spaceships took the iconic images of the Martian surface that showed a face-like formation, as you can see in the upper part of the picture. If you have a rich imagination, you can easily see a nose, two eyes, a mouth, and an unusual hairdo. Some even thought it was a monument built on the red planet by another civilization. How about some other unusual things people have found on Mars? Like Happy Face Crater. You can easily see why it has this nickname. Or rocks in different shapes. A pancake, brachiosaurus, or a fish. Mars also has a waffle-shaped island on its surface. It's a 1.2-mile wide feature you can see in the area of lava flows. It might be the result of lava pushing this formation from below. 
It seems astronomers have also got some images of blue dunes. It's a sea of stunning dark dunes that strong winds sculpted into long lines. They surround the planet's northern polar cap and cover a region as large as Texas. The red planet is usually known for its brown sandy dunes. So these ones certainly came as a surprise. In reality, though, they're not really blue. If you could visit Mars right now just to take a look, you'd see that these dunes appear brown and orange like the rest. And the picture is a false color image. Scientists often use false colors to highlight differences in something. For example, here, it's the difference in depth. Also, the biggest valley on Mars is so large it could eat our Grand Canyon for breakfast. It's a fascinating system of canyons 2,500 miles long called Valles Marineris, and it's over 10 times as long as the Grand Canyon. Now, if you could stretch this Martian canyon, it would go from coast to coast of the entire United States. Since Mars doesn't have any active plate tectonics, no one knows for sure how this canyon formed. One theory says a chain of volcanoes located on the other side of Mars, the one that includes Olympus Mons, bent the crust from the opposite side of the planet. This powerful force caused cracks in the Martian crust as well as activated enormous amounts of water lying under the surface. This water then emerged and carved the rock away. The force activated glaciers too, and they possibly created new pathways in this gigantic canyon system. Volcanoes on the Martian surface could have erupted about 50,000 years ago, although the most powerful eruptions happened 2-3 to three billion years ago. But the planet doesn't have active volcanoes today. Most of the heat stored in its interior during the planet's formation has been lost. So now, Mars's outer crust is way too thick for the molten rock to reach the surface. But a long time ago, eruptions formed giant volcanoes, and these volcanoes most likely had an important role in melting ice deposits, which released floods of water onto the Martian surface. Now Mars has a thin atmosphere with a volume of gas, mostly carbon dioxide, less than 1% of Earth's. But 4 billion years ago, it was way warmer and wetter than now. Its atmosphere must have been thicker back then, too. That's why it could create a powerful greenhouse effect and trap sunlight. Mars also has a powerful magnetic field. Similar to Earth's, it formed because of the currents of molten metals in the planet's core. But unlike our home planet, Mars lost its magnetic field after its core had cooled down. And without it, the planet didn't have any protection from the solar wind, which is a stream of charged particles flowing from the sun. The solar wind pulled away most of Mars's atmosphere in just a couple of hundred million years, give or take. This is what makes those powerful Martian dust storms even more intense. Mars has a fascinating history. Judging by the planet's glaciers, Mars has probably gone through multiple ice ages, just like Earth. A team of researchers got images of about 60,000 Martian rocks. Rocks were different in size and distributed randomly, which means they probably formed during different ice ages. Glaciers hide their own stories, too. Who knows what kinds of gases, rocks, or even microbes could be trapped inside? Now, if you could get into a time machine and stop it 4 billion years ago, on Mars of course, the chances are you'd see spectacular scenes of flooding. Maybe there would even be some form of life on the planet's surface. A strong meteorite impact that formed the red planet's gale crater could be something that triggered that mega-flood. After that collision, the temperatures on the planet got insanely hot. This caused the melting of all that ice that was stored on the Martian surface at that time. The flooding was so massive, it changed the geological structure of the planet's surface. It carved out big ripples, as well as waves in the sedimentary rock. Now, speaking of water, vapor has been noticed escaping the atmosphere of Mars. Also, researchers have found some evidence of water flowing on the planet's surface. There are dark streaks in the soil. They seem to get bigger in the summer and shrink over the winter. There are numerous dried-out valleys and river channels on the planet. It's possible that liquid water once flowed there. Now, most of it could be locked up in ice caps or even hidden under the surface. More and more things hint that Mars used to be habitable. Mars is the only planet we know about where only robots live. Five rovers make up the Martian population. Those are Perseverance, Opportunity, Spirit, 
Sojourner, and Curiosity. These robots are there to take pictures and samples of soil and air, and maybe even find life on the red planet. And someday, we may reunite with them on Mars. Who knows? Oh, and by the way, if you really could get into a time machine and stop it 4 billion years ago on Mars, then I'd like to buy you lunch and talk about it. My treat! So, the Terra Planet's location seems to be at these coordinates. Okay, let's go to outer space to see the situation. Is it me or is something moving? Oh no, there's too many piranhas! Oh my, there's too many of them. Oh no, 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 no! Leave me alone! Wait, no! I have to get back to the ship! We need to find shelter, now! Just a little bit more. Huh. Now we need to push off in the direction of the ship. It seems they don't see me. Come on, come on! Come on, almost! Oh no. This is the end. Aren't as bad as people say? <laughs> when you look at photos taken from spaceships or the International Space Station that show sunlit objects like Earth or the Moon, something seems wrong. Space looks too empty. No magical scenery of a nighttime sky full of stars. It would be incredibly boring to go stargazing in space, since the sky is always dark. During the daytime, the sky on our home planet is blue because of the diffusion of light. It happens when sunlight goes through the atmosphere. But if you were on the moon or somewhere else in space, there would be no atmosphere to spread this light around. That's why the sky there would always appear black. But it doesn't mean less bright out there. If you were looking out the window of the space station, you'd see just as much direct sunlight as you would gazing out of your apartment window during a cloudless day, maybe even more. When taking a picture on a sunny day, you'll probably use a short exposure, together with the narrow aperture setting on your camera. This way, just a short burst of light will get in. That's similar to how our pupils contract in sunlight so that they don't have to deal with too much light. And since it's just as bright up there in space, the process is the same when you take pictures of sunlit objects there. Using short exposure, you can get good, bright pictures of Earth or the surface of the Moon. But it also means there will be no stars in the picture. Even up there, stars are relatively dim. They don't emit enough light to show up in photos taken with such settings. Our home planet has a blue sky that slowly transforms into a beautiful orange-red palette at dusk and dawn. But if you ever get a chance to watch a sunset on Mars, you should expect the opposite, an orange-brown daytime sky that gets a bluish tint at sunset. First of all, Mars is farther away from the sun than our planet. So, when you're looking at the sun from the Martian surface, of course, it looks fainter and smaller. And not just that, the sun observed from Mars is just a bluish-white dot surrounded by a blue halo. The thin atmosphere of the red planet contains large dust particles, they create an effect called my scattering. It occurs when the diameter of particles in the atmosphere is almost the same as the wavelength of the scattered light. This effect filters out the red light from the sun's rays. So, only the blue light would reach your eyes on Mars.
How come Earth doesn't have rings? All gas giants in our solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have such rings, whereas the rocky planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars don't. There are two theories about how rings can appear around a planet. They might be just some material left from the times when the planet was forming, or they may be the remains of a moon that got destroyed by a collision with some space body, or torn apart by the strong gravitational pull of its parent planet. The gas giants formed in the outer regions of our solar system, while all the rocky planets are in the inner part. So maybe the inner planets were more protected from potential collisions that could have formed their rings. There are also more moons in the outer regions of our solar system, which could be another reason why the planets there have rings. Also, bigger planets have stronger gravity. It means that they can keep their rings stable after they form. Some experts believe Earth used to have a ring system a long time ago. A Mars-sized object might have collided with our home planet, which probably created a dense ring of debris around it. Some scientists think that this debris formed not a ring, but what we know today as the Moon. There's probably a giant planet lurking at the edge of the solar system, far beyond Neptune. Scientists call this mysterious hypothetical world Planet 9. If it does exist, it's probably similar to Uranus or Neptune, and 10 times more massive than our home planet. It's likely to circle around the Sun, but in the outer reaches of the solar system, about 20 times farther than Neptune. Another interesting theory says that Planet 9 could actually be a black hole the size of a grapefruit that warps space in a similar way a large planet would. Even though we once thought it was a rare substance in space, water exists all over our solar system. For example, you can often find it in asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on the Moon and Mercury. We still don't know if there's enough water to support potential human colonies if we decide to move there, but some amount of water is definitely present there. Mars has water at its poles too. It's mostly hidden in the layers of ice and probably under the planet's dusty surface. Europa, Jupiter's moon, has some water too. This is the most likely candidate we know about to host life outside Earth. There's probably a whole ocean of liquid water under its frozen surface. It might actually contain twice as much water as all of Earth's oceans combined. Neptune is unexpectedly warm. Even though it's 30 times as far from the Sun as our planet and receives less sunlight and heat, but it still radiates way more heat than it gets. It also has way more activity in its atmosphere than you'd suspect, especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Both of these planets emit the same amount of heat, even though Uranus is much closer to the Sun. No one knows why. Neptune has extremely strong winds that can reach a speed of up to 1,500 miles per hour. Can they produce this heat? Or maybe it's because of the planet's core, or its gravitational force? There's a monster black hole hurtling through space at a speed of 5 million miles per hour. Scientists located it with the Hubble Space Telescope. They believe it weighs as much as a billion suns. It was supposed to stay put in the center of its home galaxy, but some gravitational forces are pushing it around. At one point, this black hole is going to break free from its galaxy and continue roaming the universe. Luckily, it's still 8 billion years away from us. Solar storms are so powerful that they could leave us in complete darkness. Back in July 2012, the strongest solar storm in over 150 years narrowly missed Earth. Coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, are large bubbles of ionized gas. They tore through our orbit back then. If they had caught our planet in the crosshairs, we would have literally been in the firing line. We'd have faced solar matter hurtling towards Earth, damaging computers and causing power outages that would have lasted for months. A surprise solar storm hit us on June 25, 2022. One photographer even managed to capture stunning bright auroras that flashed across the dawn sky in Calgary, Canada, and lasted for five minutes. They were caused by the storm. Vampire stars are a real thing. They're part of a binary star, and they can literally drain the life out of the other star in the system. They do it to keep burning for a longer time. It works like this. A smaller star with a lower mass steals its sibling's hydrogen fuel to increase its own mass. 
this vampire star then becomes hotter. Plus, its color changes to striking blue. This way, it looks much younger. How sneaky! The color of the universe is dubbed Cosmic Latte. The light coming from our galaxies and stars within them, as well as clouds of gas and dust in the observable universe, have a specific color. It's an ivory tint, pretty close to white. The universe is beige because there are a bit more areas that produce green, yellow, and red light than those that emit blue. Our Sun is an average-sized star, and still, it could fit 1,300,000 Earths. The star is also 333,000 times as heavy as our planet. NASA has translated radio waves created by planets' atmospheres into audible sounds. That's how astronomers found out that Neptune sounds like ocean waves. Jupiter, like being underwater. And Saturn's voice resembles background music to a horror movie. Here on Earth, it's bebop jazz. Now I made that up. The sun's surface is scorching hot, but a bolt of lightning is five times hotter. Earth gets struck by 100 lightning bolts every second, which results in 8 million lightning strikes a day and around 3 billion a year. Ooh, shocking. If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. Astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bored and wanted to check how things are going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the Cosmic Microwave Background Map, or CMB for short. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. So, you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So, if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some… discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than the Sun. Their event horizon is wide, and the gravity doesn't change as quickly. So, the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen, and since there's not any in space, well… Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40-365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. <laughs> Small comfort. 
When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way, called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine, but space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun, while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side, and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there too, so it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system, the South Pole Aiken Basin. It's as wide as two states of Texas. Yeehaw! One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. Now, the astronauts didn't need them when they left the moon and tossed them when the moonwalk was over. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even tossed the armrests of the seats in the lunar module to reduce the weight. Now, counting all the Apollo lunar missions, the total weight of rubbish on the moon is approximately 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, six lunar modules, and all the experiments left behind. That's like three Boeing 737s. Another myth about the sun is that it's yellow. Let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and it's white! The sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of this spectrum. Oh, one more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa, we're in an asteroid belt, and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid clouds. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon. 
So there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the dimension of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. Venus has exceptionally high temperatures, hot enough to melt lead. It's the hottest planet in our solar system, with a high-pressure environment and super strong winds. The winds there are 50 times faster than the planet's rotation. It's getting stronger over time, and scientists don't know why. But they did find something interesting in the planet's clouds, a potential sign of decaying biological matter. Could there be life then? Not quite, since Venus has a dry, windy atmosphere and doesn't have enough water for life to develop. Rings around other planets are more common than we thought. Saturn's rings are the most famous and spectacular ones. They partially consist of reflective, sparkly water ice, and you can't see anything like that in the rest of our solar system. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune have ring systems too, and those most likely consist of dust and rocky particles. And not just planets, astronomers found out rings were around one asteroid as well. Speaking of rings, why do you think that Earth doesn't have them? Gas giants have rings, while the rocky ones don't. Two theories explain how rings form. They could be the remains from the times when planets were forming. Or they could be leftover material of an impact that destroyed an unknown moon. Or gravity broke apart this moon of its parent planet. It's not clear why only the gas planets have rings. They formed in the outer area of our solar system, while rocky planets only in its inner circles. Maybe a good clue. Maybe these inner rocky planets had just better protection from strong impacts that could have formed rings. Also, there are more moons in the outer solar system. And there are more rings there. Another thing may be that bigger planets have a bigger volume, so a ring system can remain stable there. Some theories even say that Earth used to have a ring system. A long, long time ago, our planet collided with a Mars-sized object, which most likely resulted in a dense ring of particles and debris. But our story was a bit different than the outer planets, and those rings probably combined and formed the Moon. Do we know the shape of the universe? Einstein had a theory of general relativity. It said that the universe could be in one of these three forms, closed like a sphere, open like a saddle, or flat like a piece of paper. Its shape determines whether it's infinite or not, and whether it will expand forever or maybe collapse at some point. The shape of the universe depends on its density and rate of expansion. One of the best ways to determine its shape is to use something called the cosmic microwave background. It's the relic afterglow, something that's left of the Big Bang. Sound waves that were moving through the universe in its early stages produced quite small spatial variations in the temperature of its faint light. The result of these studies show that the universe probably expands in all directions, which means it's flat. How come our sun is hot while the moon is cold? The sun gives off heat because its core is extremely hot. In there, the pressure is pretty high. The hydrogen turns into helium. That's how the sun creates light and heat. The solar light and heat are enough to light up our days on Earth, as well as support life here, even though the sun is around 93 million miles away from us. The moon is not hot because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it can't absorb sunlight as our planet does. Its surface gets very hot in the daytime, about 210 degrees Fahrenheit. But since there's no atmosphere, the temperature drops extremely during the night to negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is hot, no doubt there, but the space around it is very cold. Heat is the energy objects store inside of it. Temperature is how we measure if something is hot or cold. So when you transfer heat to certain objects, its temperature goes up. Take it away, and the temperature goes down. You can transfer heat in three different ways. Convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection works within gases and liquids, and conduction is for solids. The temperature only affects matter. Space doesn't have enough particles. 
It's nearly a complete vacuum, which means transferring heat is not effective. The only way to do it is through radiation. When the heat coming from the sun falls on an object in the form of radiation, the atoms that make up that object will absorb energy. This energy moves the atoms and makes them produce heat throughout this process. In space, temperatures of the objects stay the same for a long time. Cold objects stay cold, and hot ones stay hot. If you place anything outside of the Earth's atmosphere and expose it to direct sunlight, the sun will heat it to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Objects in outer space that surround our planet and don't receive sunlight directly are at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature is like this because there are molecules that escape our atmosphere, so the sun heats them. We used to think that water was really rare in space, but now we know there's water ice across our entire solar system. For starters, you can usually find water on asteroids and comets. It's also in craters on Mercury and the Moon that are in permanent shadows. On Mars, you'd find ice at its poles, under the surface dust and in frost. It might not be enough to support human colonies up there, but it's still something. Some other bodies in our solar system also contain ice, like the dwarf planet Ceres and one of Saturn's moons. Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, could be one of the most likely candidates we know about that could contain life. It probably has an entire ocean under its frozen and cracked surface. It could have twice as much water as all oceans on our planet together. Titan, the biggest of Saturn's moons, also has a liquid cycle, but it's not water. Its cycle moves materials between the surface and the atmosphere. At first, it sounds like the water cycle we have on Earth. But immense lakes on Titan are filled with ethane and methane. There's a chance they're over a layer of water. Neptune is about 30 times as far from the Sun as we are. Of course, it gets significantly less light and heat than Earth. But it also radiates way more heat than it's generating. There are more things happening in its atmosphere especially if you compare it to its neighbor, Uranus. Uranus is closer to the Sun, but it still radiates the same amount of heat as Neptune. The winds on Neptune are insanely strong, 1,500 miles per hour. No one still knows why. It could be a gravitational contraction, energy coming from its core, or the Sun. I hope we'll eventually find out. Can you imagine hot ice? It exists just 33 light-years away from us, on one exoplanet. This planet consists of different water elements and they form burning ice. The ice there is solid because of pressure, but the surface temperatures are extreme and go up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how the water stays super hot and comes off as steam. Picture putting ice in your coffee when you want to heat it up. When you stargaze, it's almost like you're looking into the past. Stars are really far away, and it takes longer for their light to reach our planet. So it's possible some of them have already run out of fuel and aren't alive anymore. The pillars of creation are a good example. This is part of a region 7,000 light years away from us called the Eagle Nebula. These are clouds of gas and dust in the shape of pillars. Scientists first discovered it in 1995, but in reality, a supernova explosion destroyed these pillars that were at least 6,000 years ago. So, the 1995 image shows these pillars from 7,000 years ago. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system that we know of so far. It's bigger than the whole state of Hawaii, and 100 times larger than the biggest volcano on Earth. The red planet seems so quiet, but once upon a time, large volcanoes dominated its surface. Volcanoes on the red planet can probably grow so big because gravity there is a lot weaker than down on Earth. Also, the crust on our planet is moving all the time, and the Martian crust probably stays still. Imagine a basketball spinning on someone's finger. A point near the middle of the ball takes longer to spin back to where it started than the spot where your finger is. Earth spins in much the same way. People in the center of Africa are turning at 1,000 miles per hour as the planet rotates, while anyone at the South Pole doesn't really move at all, other than rotating in place. At the same time, we're all moving forward through space equally fast, 
since the planet is also hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The temperature at the boundary of our planet's inner and outer core is 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as hot as the surface of the sun. And the pressure there is 3.3 million times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it's no larger than an average car, it's still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it's only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it's our temporary mini-moon. It won't be with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. Temporarily captured objects, such as 2020 CD3, are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. The movement of galaxies and clusters billions of light years away from us suggests there's some enormously massive body outside the visible universe. After billions of years, the expansion of the universe will make the space so sparse that we won't be able to see the stars in the sky at all. The moon isn't a perfect sphere. It's shaped like an egg. Plus, the satellite's center of mass is a bit more than a mile off its geometric center. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow. But not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. <laughs> not a great vacation spot. Saturn is mostly composed of hydrogen and helium, with some traces of methane, ammonia, and water. But it contains more sulfur than Jupiter, which gives the planet a smog-like orange hue. On Earth, sound waves make air molecules vibrate, which is why we're able to hear sound. Other planets and moons allow sound to travel through mediums like their atmospheres and oceans, too. In space, though, it's said that there is no sound, since there aren't any molecules to vibrate and deliver sound waves. However, not all researchers agree on this, given that space isn't just a desolate vacuum. In between the emptiness, there are clouds of gas and other stray particles. So, depending on where you are, sound waves can be possible. Astronomers know for sure that the universe is growing bigger, and the speed at which it's ballooning is increasing all the time. But if the whole thing is swelling into something bigger, then it must have some kind of an edge, right? It's unlikely that people will ever find out, but if so, then what would it be? A ginormous brick wall and then nothing? An abyss that leads to nowhere? The most common theory is that the universe is shaped in such a way that it can't have an edge. But it's not the only idea. Another theory is even more difficult to comprehend. The universe is, indeed, infinite. And our part of it isn't that unique. It means that somewhere out there, there's another you. Or rather, other you. One of them is just a bit shorter. Another wears their hair in a different way. And the third one is identical to you in all possible ways. There's also a theory about a multi-universe that consists of many smaller universes. And the universe we live in is just a tiny bubble among other similar bubbles. Those scientists who support this idea are also sure that bubble universes can come into contact with one another. Then gravity starts to flow between them. And when two or three universes connect, a big bang occurs, just like the one that created our home universe. Neptune is the windiest place in the solar system. Clouds of frozen methane are whipped across the planet at a speed of 1,200 miles per hour. Neptune's core is solid and consists mostly of iron and some other metals. Its mass is 1.2 times bigger than that of Earth. The temperature inside reaches 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers also believe that at a depth of 4,500 miles, there might be a diamond layer where it's raining diamond crystals. On Earth, people are used to a beautiful sunset that's painted in hues of orange, red, and yellow. On Mars, however, the normally pinkish red sky turns blue as the sun goes down under the horizon. It's because Mars is much farther away from the sun than Earth, making the sunlight less intense. The fine dust in the Martian atmosphere absorbs the blue light and gets rid of the warmer colors that you typically see on Earth. Whether it's blue or yellow, 
both sunsets look spectacular. At around a quarter of the size of Earth, the Moon is pretty enormous relative to other satellites out in space. There's nothing quite like this situation anywhere else in the solar system. Pluto has a moon that's almost half as big as itself, but it's more like a twin than a satellite. There are more than 150 moons in our solar system, and Earth's is the fifth largest out of the whole lot. There might be a labyrinth of lava tubes on the moon. Not long ago, astronomers received the results of an underground lunar topography. They discovered a massive cave under the satellite's surface. About 30 miles long and 60 miles wide, the cave's likely to be the result of 3 billion-year-old volcanic activity. After streams of lava hardened, they created a thick, hard crust on the outside. But inside, lava kept flowing, melting the rock, and forming tunnels and caves. Countless pits in the moon's surface discovered by NASA might be the openings to lava tubes. We can't dig up most of Earth's gold. 99% of it ended up in the center of the planet several billion years ago, attracted by the iron in Earth's core. We're talking about 1.6 quadrillion tons of gold here. That's enough to coat the entire planet's surface in 1.5 feet of the stuff. And if all those meteorites hadn't later smashed into the ground, bringing extra amounts of gold, it would be even rarer. Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a massive blob of some mysterious substance. It was hidden underneath the surface of the moon's far side. Its mass was the same as that of a pile of metal five times larger than the big island of Hawaii. The enigmatic something lies almost 200 miles beneath an enormous crater that appeared on the lunar surface billions of years ago. The blob likely has something to do with a super collision. It might be the metal core of the object that hit the moon back then. Scientists can't wait to lay their hands on the discovery. It could explain lots of things about the South Pole Aitken crater, the largest known in the solar system. If it was on Earth, its oval-shaped basin would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Texas. In 2011, astronomers discovered an enormous water reservoir simply floating in space around a supermassive black hole called a quasar. Floating water vapors have been found throughout the universe, but they aren't that common. This particular reservoir holds around 140 trillion times the amount of water in the Earth's oceans. It's one of the oldest, largest, and, at more than 12 billion light years away, one of the farthest things known to humankind. Astronauts in space can lose about 1% of their muscle mass each month. To prevent this, they have to stick to an exercise regimen that lasts two hours every single day. The Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are going to meet in 3.75 billion years. They're moving toward each other at a breakneck speed. When the two galaxies collide, they'll form a huge elliptical galaxy. I won't be around then. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and tried to count all the stars? Yeah, good luck. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 100 billion stars. But other estimates put it at over 200 billion, since calculating the exact amount is an almost impossible task, even for astronomers. As for the entire universe, there are at least a billion trillion stars. That's one with 21 zeros after it. For comparison, that means there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on all of the Earth's beaches. Venus most likely used to be covered with oceans, from 30 to 1,000 feet deep. Also, some water was locked in the soil of the planet. On top of that, Venus had stable temperatures of 68 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which, you have to admit, was quite pleasant and not that different from the temperatures on Earth nowadays. So, what I'm getting at is that for 3 billion years, right until something irrevocable happened 700 million years ago, Venus could have been habitable. But now, it's not. The Moon is the second brightest object in our sky. At the same time, among other astronomical bodies, it's one of the dimmest and least reflective. Our natural satellite only seems bright because it's so close to Earth. For comparison, our planet looks much brighter when you look at it from space. It's because clouds, ice, and snow reflect way more light than most types of rock. Triton, Neptune's moon, has all its surface covered with several layers of ice. 
If this satellite replaced our current moon, the night sky would get seven times brighter. Neutron stars are some of the smallest, yet most massive objects in space. They're usually about 12 miles in diameter, but are several times heavier than the sun. Oh, and they also spin about 600 times per second, far faster than your average figure skater. Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It has one-eighth the average Earth's density. And still, because of its large volume, the planet is 95 times more massive than Earth. A transient lunar phenomenon is one of the most enigmatic things happening on the moon. It's a short-lived light, color, or some other change on the satellite surface. Most commonly, it's random flashes of light. Astronomers have been observing this phenomenon since the 1950s. They've noticed that the flashes occur randomly. Sometimes they can happen several times a week. After that, they disappear for several months. Some of them don't last longer than a couple of minutes. But there have been those that continued for hours. The year was 1969, one day before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. One of the mission participants noticed that one part of the lunar surface was more illuminated than the surrounding landscape. It looked as if that area had a kind of fluorescence to it. Unfortunately, it's still unclear if this phenomenon was connected with the mysterious lunar flashes. Trash isn't just a problem in Earth's oceans, cities, and forests. There is a thing called space junk, which is any human-made object that's been left in space and now serves no purpose. There's also natural debris from meteoroids and other cosmic objects. There are currently over 500,000 pieces of space debris orbiting the Earth at speeds high enough to cause significant damage if they were to collide with a spacecraft or satellite. NASA does its best to track every single object to ensure that missions outside Earth can reach their destination safely. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. The Sun's temperature is hotter than the surface of a star. The surface temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. If someone could dig a tunnel straight into the center of the planet and out the opposite side, and you were adventurous enough to jump into it, it would take you 42 minutes to fall to the other side. You'd speed up as you fell, reaching maximum speed by the time you reached Earth's core. After the halfway point, you would then fall upwards, getting slower and slower. By the time you reached the opposite surface, your speed would be back to zero. Unless you managed to climb out of the hole, you'd immediately start falling again, back down or up to the other side of the planet. This trip would go on forever, all thanks to the weird effects of gravity. Hey, might be a fun way to spend an afternoon. There might be more metals, for example, titanium or iron, in lunar craters than astronomers used to think. The main problem with this finding? It contradicts the main theory about how the moon was formed. That theory says that Earth's natural satellite was spun off from our planet after a collision with a massive space object. But then, why does Earth's metal-poor crust have much less iron oxide than the moon's? It might mean the moon was formed from the material lying much deeper inside our planet. Or these metals could have appeared when the molten lunar surface was slowly cooling down. Or maybe, as they've been saying for centuries, it's made of green cheese. Earth could have been purple before it turned blue and green. One scientist has a theory that a substance existed in ancient microbes before chlorophyll, that thing that makes plants green, evolved on Earth. This substance reflected sunlight in red and violet colors, which combined to make purple. If true, the young Earth may have been teeming with strange purple-colored critters before all the green stuff appeared. The highest mountain in the solar system is Olympus Mons on Mars. It's three times as high as Mount Everest, the Earth's highest mountain above sea level. If you were standing on top of Olympus Mons, you wouldn't understand you were standing on a mountain. Its slopes would be hidden by the planet's curvature. Astronomers have found a massive reservoir of water in space, the largest ever detected. Too bad it's also the farthest, 12 billion light-years away from us. 
The water vapor cloud holds 140 trillion times as much water as all the Earth's oceans combined. What are we supposed to do with that information? Venus spins at its own unhurried pace. A full rotation takes 243 Earth days, and it takes the planet a bit less than 225 Earth days to go all the way around the Sun. It means a day on Venus is longer than a year. There's very little seismic activity going on inside the Moon. Yet many moonquakes, caused by our planet's gravitational pull, sometimes happen several miles below the surface. After that, tiny cracks and fissures appear in the satellite surface, and gases escape through them. Hey, they sometimes escape from me, too. Now Mars is the last of the inner planets, which are also called terrestrial since they're made up of rocks and metals. The red planet has a core made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. It's between 900 and 1,200 miles across. The core doesn't move. That's why Mars lacks a planet-wide magnetic field. The weak magnetic field it has is just 1 100th percent of the Earth's. When the planets in the solar system were just starting to form, Earth didn't have a moon for the longest time. It took 100 million years for our natural satellite to appear. There are several theories as to how the moon came into existence, but the prevailing one is the fission theory. Somebody went fishing and caught the moon? Actually, no. The fission theory proposes that the moon was formed when an object collided with Earth, sending particles flying about. Gravity pulled the particles together, and the moon was created. It eventually settled down on the Earth's ecliptic plane, which is the path that the moon orbits. So, looks like the green cheese is off the table now. The largest single living thing on Earth turns out to be a mushroom in Oregon. This enormous honey mushroom lives in Malheur National Forest and covers an area of 3.7 square miles. It could be as much as 8,500 years old. You could be forgiven for missing it, though, since most of it's hidden underground. When the roots of individual honey mushrooms meet, they can fuse together to become a single fungus, which explains how this one got so big. If you could gather all that mushrooming stuff into one big ball, it could weigh as much as 35,000 tons. That's about as heavy as 200 gray whales. Hey, that's a whale of a mushroom. <laughs> the largest asteroid in the solar system is called Vesta, and it's so big that it's sometimes even called a dwarf planet. A trip to the nearest star apart from the sun would take you 5 million years on a commercial airplane. That's what I call a long haul flight. Space isn't supposed to be black. There are stars everywhere. Shouldn't they light up everything around? Well, you don't see stars wherever you look because some of them haven't existed long enough for their light to reach Earth. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Now, some scientists believe that our planet used to have an additional satellite. According to their research, a small celestial body about 750 miles wide orbited Earth like a second moon. It most likely crashed into our main satellite later on. Such a collision could explain why the two sides of the moon look so different from each other, one being heavily cratered and rough. Or it could be the green cheese. The sun's heat is beneath our feet. Scientists have figured out that Earth's core is actually as hot as the surface of the sun, around 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the reasons it's so incredibly hot down there is because Earth is still shedding heat from when it was created billions of years ago. Also, when an object as big as Mars slammed into the young Earth, it not only created the moon, according to one theory, but melted the surface of the planet. A lot of that extra heat is probably still stored inside the core. But there's no need to worry. The planet's core is harder for us to access than it is to probe the surface of Pluto. In fact, chances are we may never develop technology that could physically reach the core. There's no air on the moon. But then, how can it be rusting? 
Scientists have discovered the presence of hermatite on the moon, and it's a kind of rust. A special NASA research instrument examined the light reflected off the moon's surface. It turned out that the composition of the satellite's poles was very different from the rest of it. The moon's surface is dotted with iron-rich rocks, but without oxygen and liquid water, rust can't appear. Solar winds add to the mystery. They bombard the moon with hydrogen, and hydrogen makes it much more difficult for hematite to form. Even though the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it still has some trace amounts of oxygen. Its source is our planet's upper atmosphere. Earth also protects the moon from almost 100% of solar winds, although not all the time. And even though our natural satellite is bone dry, there might be water ice in the shadowed craters on its far side. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart, and it will likely result in the formation of a ring around the planet. The Earth is the densest in the solar system. At the Earth's center, there's a core that takes up 15% of the planet's volume. It consists of two parts, the outer and the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles, which makes 20% of the entire Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's radius. The 1,500-mile-thick outer core is liquid. It also consists of iron and nickel, but it's not under enough pressure to be solid. Mars houses the biggest volcano in the solar system. While everything seems to be calm on Mars nowadays, in the past, some sort of force caused enormous volcanoes to form and erupt. One of these volcanoes is Olympus Mons. It's 16 miles tall, which is the height of three Mount Everests and 374 miles across, making it about the size of Arizona. The volcano grew to such a gargantuan size because of the weak gravity on Mars and the lack of tectonic plate movement. Gravity is not the same everywhere. The rocks, metals, and other minerals and substances that make up the planet are packed into the ground more tightly in certain places than in others. This has surprising consequences. Gravity varies slightly depending on where you are. You weigh 0.5% less standing at the equator than you do at the poles. In most cases, that's a difference of less than one pound. How high up you are also has an effect. So if you were at the top of Mount Everest, you'd also weigh slightly less. Just don't look down. Earth's toughest living thing is so small, you can't see it. Water bears, also known as moss piglets, are cute little creatures with eight legs and squashed up heads that are less than a hundredth of an inch in length. Despite their microscopic stature, they can basically survive anywhere. They prefer bits of wet moss or the bottom of a lake, but they won't complain if you put them somewhere really uncomfortable. They can endure extreme cold and incredible heat and survive both huge pressure and high radiation. Some of the little bears once even managed to survive unprotected in outer space for 10 days without a problem. <laughs> that is tough. They handle all these things by rolling up into a ball and hibernating, which reduces their need for oxygen and food. The moon's gravity is about 17% of that on Earth. If you weighed 200 pounds on our home planet, on the moon, your weight would decrease to a mere 34 pounds. You would also be able to carry stuff six times heavier than what you can carry on Earth. It would also be easier to walk on the moon's surface, but it would be more dangerous too. Your feet, inside a heavy spacesuit, would sink into the lunar soil up to six inches deep. But let's imagine you decided to skip the tedious process of walking by leaping through the air. Then you'd likely lose control of your jumps in no time. Plus, the moon's surface is littered with deep craters. It would be a tough feat to avoid all of them. You can see solar eclipses because even though the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, it's also 400 times closer to Earth. So it's perfectly capable of obscuring the star. 
But in 50 million years, I won't be around then. The moon won't be able to block the sun completely because of the satellite's changing orbit. A full NASA spacesuit costs an unbelievable $12 million. Yeah, I can believe that. 70% of this hefty sum is for the control module and backpack. At the very center of Uranus, there's a rocky core. Small, just half the Earth's mass. Compared to other planets, Uranus's core is rather cool. 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. An ice mantle surrounds the solid core, and that's the largest portion of the planet, about 80%. It's also not the ice you might be thinking about. It's a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia, ice, and methane, sometimes referred to as a water-ammonia ocean. Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but it has its blue-green color because of methane gas that absorbs the red light. The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other in the solar system. But unlike Earth's oceans, it's made not of water, but of metallic hydrogen. The ocean's depth is a mind-blowing 25,000 miles. That's almost the same as the distance around Earth. Venus is a champ when it comes to volcanoes. The planet has about 1,600 major ones, but none of them is known to erupt. There's a supermassive black hole 250 million light years away from us. It hums the deepest sound ever detected from any object in the universe. It's 57 octaves lower than the middle C on your piano. That's one quadrillion times deeper than what we can hear. Mercury is a few billion years old. In 2016, Scientists discovered some abnormalities on the planet's surface, showing that it's getting smaller. After more research, they found out that Mercury hadn't finished cooling down yet. There are planets that aren't bound to any star orbit and aimlessly wander through outer space. Among the most spectacular-looking space objects are pulsars. Pulsars are a type of neutron star. They shoot out some of their material almost at the speed of light. Regular pulsars spin at a reasonable speed, between one-tenth to sixty times per second. But millisecond pulsars can spin at an impressive seven hundred times a second, which is way too fast for the human eye to even process. As they spin, they emit a beam of radiation from their axis that looks like the light from a lighthouse. Astronomers can notice pulsars when they face Earth, since it looks like a light being shined on our planet. When the light shines elsewhere, the pulsar can't be seen. Our sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. Saturn's rings are very thin compared to its size. If you had a scale model of the planet that was three feet wide, the rings would be 10,000 times thinner than a razor blade. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow, but not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. Not a great vacation spot. Behold the distant future. Yep, humans have successfully colonized Mars and the Moon. Problems with overpopulation and hunger on Earth are solved. But soon, a new threat looms over our planet. Uh, excuse me, planets. And the Moon. Anyway, scientists have figured out that in 150 years, the Sun will explode and destroy our entire solar system. Bummer. There's enough time to build a fleet of huge spaceships and evacuate everyone. But it's not enough time to come up with some sort of sci-fi space jump. It's been a long time since people found a new, potentially livable planet, and the nearest one's a several million years ride away. There's no other choice. Humankind is evacuated into gargantuan spaceships, and the infinitely long voyage begins. A few decades pass we leave the solar system and watch our sun explode. 
a huge flash, and that's it. There's no more light, just small, faraway stars and the infinite black depths of space. All ships are on a synced autopilot that won't go off course no matter what. Even if everyone on board were to disappear, the ship would still arrive at its destination. So, the upside, humans will survive for millions more years. The downside? Because of all of that time spent on space transports, we'll look different, totally different. Ships arriving to the new planet will be populated with shapeless, pulsating biomasses sitting inside metal exoskeletons. Here's how it happens. Bones in space get weaker, so do muscles. There's no gravity, so your body's not under any sort of pressure to keep it running properly. Astronauts on the International Space Station do a lot of exercise to stop their muscles from withering away. Ah, back to the story. There are gyms and special machines that recreate gravity on every space transport. But to save energy, they're only plugged in in a couple of hours per day. Unfortunately, no matter how hard people exercise, in space it just won't be enough. After the first hundred years, human bones have become so brittle that anything remotely physical can lead to injury. After another hundred years, people lose the ability to stand up on their two legs. But it's not only because of weak bones. After all those years in zero gravity, the human body's already changed a lot. A big problem is that people lose their sense of balance. If you try to stand up, you'll just fall. The ship's captains dismantled the gravity machines. They weren't working anyways. And all the sports equipment on board got taken apart ages ago and used as spare parts for the ships. The lack of gravity didn't just make people weaker. It also made them taller. The spine needs gravity to keep it stable. And now all those backbone discs have stretched themselves out. Humans are starting to look like blow-up toys. Everyone's given mechanical arms and legs. You just strap them on and get to work. Servicing the engine, cleaning out the bedrooms, throwing trash out into space, lifting anything. Not happening without those mechanical arms and legs. Time passes, and people become more helpless. Luckily, the mechanical bodysuits keep getting better and better. Since the sun collapsed in on itself, human eyes have been having a hard time. Inside the ships, the sun is replaced by special artificial light that also gives off vitamin D. Since there's way less light overall, people's pupils become wider. Then, after a few more centuries, their vision really starts going downhill. But this problem is solved by technology. Artificial lenses magnify light and keep humans from going completely blind. The ships get disinfected every single day. That stops bacteria and microbes from multiplying. But it also means that the human immune system doesn't have to fight off any diseases. Pretty soon, humans can't defend themselves against anything. Even a mild cold could be seriously harmful. It's fine for now. There are no germs or anything on board, but what's going to happen later on down the road? On the ship, millions of plants grow in special greenhouses with water and ultraviolet light. The plants produce oxygen and spread it through the entire ship. Of course, it's not enough oxygen to satisfy millions, but it helps people remember the planet they left behind. After centuries of living on spaceships, humans have adapted to the new conditions and almost stopped breathing. Lungs have disappeared almost completely, and humans are starting to develop other ways of getting oxygen. From water, from liquid oxygen tanks, we're becoming a totally new species. But it's not all bad. Genetic engineering is developing every year. Full-fledged life support suits are created. They help with movement, strength, speed, vision, hearing, even speech. People's voices get so weak they can only speak in whispers. Luckily, the suits have built-in microphones and speakers. There's no food anymore, just specially created liquids. After all that time in space, the human stomach can't digest anything anyway. Fancy a handful of peanuts or a small cracker? Forget it! In the beginning, the special space food had loads of flavor. But over time, people sort of forgot what things were supposed to taste like. Eventually, they stopped adding in flavorings, and because of this new tasteless food, tongue receptors stopped working. Soon, people lost all sense of taste. For some people, this life seems unbearable, 
But they have a choice. They can just slide on into a cryogenic capsule for millions of years. Then it's just a matter of a quick defrost when the ships finally arrive. But it's seriously risky to be frozen for such a long time. There's no guarantee that the ships won't crash into a huge meteorite, or worse. People start to take a different approach. They upload their consciousness to a central computer. It's safer and requires much less power. And when you wake up, you can just download your mind into a new, modified human suit. Some people decide to stay awake and live a, quote, normal life. Thousands of years pass, then millions. Humans look really different now. All their limbs are now artificial, and the exoskeletons they wear are controlled by mind power. With each passing millennium, arms, neck, legs, and spines, they become smaller and smaller. Brittle bones soon dissolve into nothingness. Eyes, nose, and mouths disappear. The brain isn't protected by a skull anymore, it's just surrounded by soft skin. Only consciousness remains. Nowadays, a human is a powerful high-tech robot ruled over by a small, pulsating bag filled with a brain. It's been a few million years since humans left Earth. All the ship's inhabitants have already forgotten that their species was born on a planet with gravity. The history of life on Earth has become a myth, an ancient legend. Most people believe that these ships are their true homes, always have been. That's why, when humans finally reach their destination, no one's that eager to get off and have a walk around. Life on a new, unknown planet seems like a huge pain in the spacesuit. Gravity, air, bacteria, germs… It takes several thousand years of evolution for humanity to get used to these new conditions. Luckily, humans have a secret weapon – technology. At this point, all humans are downloaded from the central computer into new robot suits. People face a choice – get off the ship and make this planet their new home, or stay and live on the ships. Those that stay on the ships set off into the expanses of space to explore the galaxy and discover new worlds. Those who decide to stay on the new planet have to adapt to the new conditions. It's pretty different from Earth. There's a different air density, different weather patterns, and strange new chemical elements. It will take another million years before these robo-brain sacs take on a new shape. One day, these distant human descendants will want to research their origins. They'll invent a ship that can jump through space and time. The research will lead them to the distant past, to the small planet Earth, to now. This might sound crazy, but just imagine that tomorrow someone lands in your backyard and they're your descendants from the future. Those passengers who stayed on the ships will probably find new planets and maybe decide to stay on some of them. Their bodies will change and adapt too. So in billions of years, the universe will be inhabited by different amazing creatures that all have something in common. They were all humans once. What can survive in space? Well, people can, if they have an excellent spacesuit. Spacesuits are, shall we say, kind of a needed item in the vacuum of space. Without one, you'll have to stay inside the spaceship or modular dwelling on the Moon or Mars. Currently, NASA has only several older spacesuits ready for use outside the spacecraft, like the International Space Station. NASA's Artemis mission to the Moon is planning to have new suits designed for both men and women. It has a quarter-billion-dollar budget for them. These new suits are much less bulky than the older ones and much more fashionable. But what other creatures besides people can live in space? Three named animals were sent into space, and they all came home safely. Does that qualify? Two dogs, Belka and Strelka, spent a day inside a Russian spacecraft in 1960 and became media stars upon their return. The USA launched a chimp named Ham on a 16-minute ride into space. Space starts 62 miles above the ocean level and only takes a rocket a few minutes to get there. Ham, who wore a spacesuit, performed all his button-pushing tasks admirably and is honored in the International Space Hall of Fame in Alamogordo, New Mexico. But tardigrades can actually live in space. 
Tardigrades, or water bears as they are often called, are brown and look like teeny tiny grizzly bears, and are one of the most miniature animals with legs. They have eight of them. Most species of tardigrades have no eyes, but some do. It's possible to see water bears with a good magnifying glass, since they average about a half millimeter in size. Sprinkle a little water on moss, and they'll come out. They can walk about one body length per second and run at about two body lengths per second. Water bear eggs are easier to spot because they're bright white. The European Space Agency took water bears to the International Space Station and left them outside for 10 days. They survived. They still survived with no air, water, almost a perfect vacuum, harmful solar radiation, extreme cold, and heat. Well, that doesn't sound very fun, does it? In extreme conditions, water bears rely on their exoskeleton, or tun, to protect themselves. In laboratory tests, this exoskeleton could withstand immense pressure at over 87,000 pounds per square inch. That's quite a spacesuit they got. Water bears have even been frozen solid for 30 years. And when warmed up, the water bears revived and were still able to reproduce. As we search for life in space, as we explore Mars, these types of extreme life forms become essential to understand. If water bears can survive literally every environmental condition, can we conclude that life is everywhere in space? Extremophiles are life forms living in extreme conditions, such as other planets might have. Movile Cave in the country of Romania is one such place that could just well be on another planet. All life on Earth, on the surface of the Earth, is carbon-based. It means that carbon atoms act much like a universal Lego block, to which hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms connect to form the molecules that the cells of living organisms are made of. But not in Movile Cave. Movile Cave was sealed off at least 2.5 million years ago. The water that percolates up through limestone rock has formed a lake in the cave, a mix of hydrogen sulfide, poisonous and corrosive, and ammonia. What could live in this toxic soup? Well, sulfur-based life forms. An entire ecological system without light or photosynthesis exists inside Movile Cave. The food chain is built on chemosynthesis, microorganisms eating sulfur-based chemicals. 33 species of sulfur-based creatures were found living in the hostile environment of Movile Cave. Shrimp, scorpions, centipedes, snails, etc., etc. Movile Cave is an alien world, deep underground, full of sulfur-based life forms. If creatures like this exist in Movile Cave on Earth, what can we expect to find living in outer space? Bacteria. Bacteria can live in outer space. And fungi, too. Bacteria form the base of the food chain, and bacteria have been proven to be able to live in outer space. In the 1980s, cosmonauts on the Mir space station complained that something was growing outside the station's windows and blocking their view of Earth. It turned out, upon inspection, to be bacteria and fungus, or fungi. The windows, made of quartz, were being damaged and weakened by what was growing on the surface. Fungi were also found to be eating copper on some of the cables. Mold was found growing in some places on the outside of Mir. The space station was under attack by microorganisms. Scientists took this very seriously and began to investigate. It seems that in a sterile environment such as space, bacteria come out of their hiding places when no other microorganisms are around. Cosmic radiation may even help them mutate and adapt to the space environment. The bacteria seem to be growing even faster in space than on Earth. Years later, the United States decided to run a bacterial experiment on the International Space Station. They coated rocks with various bacteria and put them outside the space station. Some bacteria did not survive the harsh conditions of space, but many did. One strain called OU-20 survived for over a year and a half outside the ISS. Japan also did a bacterial experiment on the International Space Station. Outside the Japanese Kibo module, Kibo's robotic arm placed three panels with the bacteria Dinococcus radiodurans, or D radiodurans for short. It survived outside in space for three years. The lead scientists of the Japanese experiment calculated that the bacteria could live as long as eight years in space. That's long enough to make a journey to Mars and back four times. Now, this raises a couple of interesting questions. Could life have come to Earth from Mars in a space rock? And more pointedly, 
could an infectious bacteria come to Earth in a space rock? Suddenly, what had only been considered in science fiction books and movies was now a subject of intense scientific scrutiny. And then came the Mars meteor. Antarctica is the best place to find meteors because it's covered by ice. The ice in the Allen Hills regions of Antarctica is locked in place by the configuration of the surrounding mountain. The ice here sublimes. That means the ice evaporates, never becoming liquid, but turning directly into vapor. As the ice in the Allen Hills region sublimes, it exposes all the meteors that have hit the ice over many hundreds or thousands of years. Meteor hunters literally drive around on snowmobiles and pick them up with tongs, never touching them to avoid contaminating them with human bacteria. They bag the meteors, number them, and record the location and any other pertinent facts about the meteor. That's how meteor ALH84001 was found, the Mars meteor. Since Earth gets hit by about 17 meteors every day, over thousands of years, the numbers add up. Almost everywhere has been hit by a meteor at one time or another. 11 years apart, two houses on the same street in Weathersfield, Connecticut, had their roofs punctured by one-pound meteors. But only a rare few meteors ever come from Mars. 126 meteors have now been identified as coming from the red planet. ALH 84001 came from Mars. Scientists know this because the United States has landed on Mars and sampled Martian rocks and the Martian atmosphere composition. ALH 84001 contained the same gases as Mars' atmosphere and similar chemical composition as the rocks. But the meteor also contained something else, a fossilized life form. There has been much debate about whether or not the tiny object inside ALH 84001 is a fossilized bacterial life form or rather a chemical deposit. But the studies aboard the International Space Station confirm that bacteria can live for a long duration in space. So it is entirely possible that some bacteria could make the journey to Earth from Mars in a meteor. The United States Mars Exploring Perseverance rover has recently found organic molecules inside Mars rocks. These organics are carbon and hydrogen. It won't be known if these organic molecules were produced by living organisms or merely by chemical reactions until the samples are returned to Earth sometime before 2030. The search for life on Mars is ongoing. But Mars is not the only place in the solar system that might have life. Jupiter's moon Europa is a good suspect, too. Entirely covered by miles of thick water ice, Europa may have an ocean of salty water beneath its icy crust. Ice acts as an insulation blanket. Combined with possible internal thermal processes in Europa's core means that Europa's ocean water could be warm. The Europa Clipper Express mission plans to confirm conditions for life on Europa. Loaded with nine pieces of observational equipment, the Europa Clipper will attempt to observe just about everything possibly going on by orbiting above Europa including the chemical composition of the mysterious reddish-colored material that has ejected onto the surface ice from the ocean below. What could this reddish material be? Could it be a specific chemical mix? Or could it be krill, shrimp, fish, life forms like in Movell Cave? Or the ancient remnants of a bright side narrator? Hmm, stay tuned. This is the final game of the year. Millions of viewers are glued to their TV screens. The 50,000 people in the stands of the stadium are holding their breath. Everyone's waiting to see who will win this game. It'll decide the winner this year. The loudest fans have stopped chanting. The ears become thick as syrup. It's so quiet, you can hear the heartbeats of the spectators. The pitcher looks at the ball one last time. He's taking wind speed into account and prepares to bring victory to his team. There's the throw! The ball flies like a bullet through the stadium. But the batter's reaction is perfect. And then, the incredible happens. The impact energy accelerates the ball to the speed of light. Okay, let's stop now. I've got to explain this. Nothing in the universe can reach the speed of light if it has mass. For a person, a car, a rocket, even a comet, that speed is out of reach. According to Einstein's general theory of relativity, when an object moves, its size decreases and its mass increases. If an airplane accelerated to the speed of light, 
its mass would be infinite and its length, zero. It's impossible. But living by the rules is boring. Even if they're the laws of physics, I'm sure Einstein would love our idea. So, in our lawless world, the batter hit the ball and it flew at 186,000 miles per second. In just one second, the ball would fly around the Earth seven and a half times. Spectators, grass on the stadium, air molecules. Everything around is frozen. Only the ball is moving forward. The small projectile flies out of the stadium, rips apart the atmosphere, and goes into space. And then, the horror, the ball crashes into the International Space Station at full speed. The station has no chance. An object at the speed of light will blow away everything in its path. This story is impossible, not only because a baseball player's bat would break from such a blow. A small ball of leather and rubber will trigger a flash in the center of a stadium that is brighter than the sun. The bright light would be followed by a thermonuclear explosion. When the batter propels the ball to the speed of light, the show begins. The ball moves so fast that the air molecules don't have time to flow around it. The atoms in the air molecules hit the ball and mix with its atoms. Gamma rays appear. They break molecules apart. The air around the batter turns into red-hot plasma. The umpire and the catcher aren't to be envied either. Try to play baseball in volcanic lava. All this happens in nanoseconds. There's one billion nanoseconds in one second. The eyes and brains of people don't have time to analyze what's happening in front of them. The ball breaks into tiny pieces. Now it looks like a cloud of burning plasma. These are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. The stadium is engulfed in plasma and x-rays. For miles around, there's little more than a desert. The landscape resembles the surface of the moon or Mars. Let's take a look at it in slow motion. The bright light comes on first. Then a fireball appears in the middle of the stadium. Boom! The sound of the explosion reaches you. A pillar of fire bursts into the sky and turns into an eerie cloud that most resembles a colossal mushroom. Don't forget about the blast wave. It tears the trees out of the ground and knocks out all the windows in the vicinity. Thankfully, in the real world, such a situation is impossible. The International Space Station has enough problems without baseballs. Here's an American football field, and this is the ISS. The station weighs 420 tons. This is the largest spaceship ever built by humans. The large size and weight of 320 cars doesn't prevent the station from flying 5 miles per second. The ISS orbits the Earth 16 times per day. At this speed, any particle can pierce the hull of the ship or tear off one of its solar panels. There are 2,000 active satellites flying around the Earth. Another 3,000 don't work, but continue their space travel. And that's not all. In space, there are 100 million pieces of debris, no larger than half an inch. And we sent them there. At least 34,000 particles the size of your smartphone and more. Even the smallest piece can destroy an astronaut's suit, equipment, or unprotected areas of the ISS. A single screw flying at 40 times the speed of a jet is a dangerous projectile, especially in space. Still, the ISS is safe. The padding protects it against impact with small objects. Now with larger ones, it's more difficult, but scientists have figured out how to deal with them too. A security perimeter has been created around the ISS. Imagine a pizza box 15 and a half miles long and two and a half miles wide. The space station is suspended in the center of the box, and its walls are the perimeter boundaries. NASA specialists record every violator of the space border. Scientists calculate the probability of collision. If it's dangerous, the ISS begins to maneuver and avoids the impact. In 2020, the station changed its flight route three times. Hundreds of objects enter the Earth's atmosphere every year. Most are burned before they hit the planet's surface. If the metal debris bursts through the atmosphere, it most likely end up in unpopulated lands or the ocean. Still, things happen. In the early morning of January 22, 1997, Lottie Williams was walking through a park in Oklahoma. In the pre-dawn sky, she saw a bright ball of fire. The woman decided it was a shooting star. Suddenly, she felt something touch her shoulder. It turned out to be a palm-sized piece of metal. 
The blow didn't harm Ms. Williams. She was the only person on the planet to have been hit by space debris. It was part of the fuel tank of the American Delta II rocket. The probability of getting hit by space debris is minimal. A huge kraken will sooner crawl into your room than a piece of a space satellite hitting you. Debris is invisible in the stream of thousands of small meteorites. They bombard the Earth's atmosphere every day. Most of the rocks are burned in it, and those that fall onto our planet are invisible. The only confirmed case of a close encounter with a meteorite was with Ann Hodges. In 1954, a space rock broke through the roof of a house and hit the woman in the thigh. The meteorite left a hole in the ceiling and a bruise on Ms. Hodges' leg. Let's imagine what would happen if an object the size and weight of a bowling ball flies toward our planet, naturally at the speed of light. In two seconds, our space object makes the distance from the moon to the Earth. The ball will crack, but we'll have time to start thermonuclear fusion. This process will release X-rays that will transform the atmosphere into a plasma bubble. It will constantly expand. There will be no point of impact of space debris on the surface of the Earth. It won't have time to land, but it'll do a lot of nasty stuff. The explosion in the atmosphere will be colossal. The cataclysm will turn part of the planet into a lifeless desert and provoke the destruction of part of the Earth's crust. On the surface, fires, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions will begin. The sun is the main source of light in our solar system. Light from the star reaches Pluto in 5 hours and 50 minutes. Mercury is only 3 minutes and 20 seconds away. As for Earth, 8 minutes and 20 seconds are enough. If we send a spacecraft to Mars tomorrow, it will reach its destination in 7 months. A rocket that travels at the speed of light will get it done in 3 minutes. We'll hardly ever learn to fly at the speed of light. Most modern spacecraft are powered by ion engines. But scientists are looking for an alternative. For thousands of years, people traveled by ships with sails. Today, this technology is relevant again. Engineers suggest using sails in space. They propose to catch the solar wind with them. A sail is installed on the spacecraft, and photons of light hit it. This creates pressure that pushes the object forward. The most ambiguous idea so far is to create an external pulsed plasma propulsion engine. Its principle is detonating hundreds of nuclear charges behind the spacecraft. The ship will fly forward on their shockwave. Um, thanks, but no thanks. The most sci-fi way to travel in space is to use a warp drive. In this case, we can fly faster than the speed of light. But first, we have to build an engine that distorts space-time and use this distortion for space travel. So far, this technology can only be found in movies and comics. Hello, Brightsiders! Today, we have a very unusual topic. We are discussing toilets in space. Do you know that the first astronauts didn't have a toilet at all? The first American astronaut and the second man in space, Alan Shepard, found himself in a very awkward situation. His flight was only supposed to last 15 minutes, so the engineers didn't install any toilet inside his spacecraft. Shepard took his seat in the spaceship about an hour before the scheduled launch. But due to weather conditions and technical problems, the rocket launch was delayed by two hours. Alan Shepard was lying on his back in the spaceship all this time. At one point, he felt the need to go number one. He reported it to ground control, but if Alan Shepard got out of the rocket to do his business, it would delay the rocket launch indefinitely. So. Ground control didn't let him out of the rocket. The only option for him was to try and relax. In the end, he did his business right inside his suit. It's a good thing his spacesuit and the clothes underneath were made of cotton, which is quite absorbent and soaked up all the liquid. So Alan Shepard completed his flight in comfort and relatively dry. Though he still needed to turn off the sensors in his suit because if they got wet, they could cause a short circuit. But the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, managed to solve the same problem 
before the rocket was launched. When he was transported to the rocket by bus, a couple of minutes before they arrived at the rocket, he asked for a stop and relieved himself. This way, Yuri Gagarin made his nearly two-hour flight in comfort. So remember, always go to the restroom before a long trip. Later, NASA took care of astronauts' call of nature using the following device, as they sent people into space on more extended missions. It consisted of a cylinder that an astronaut had to put on. Astronauts placed this system on straps near their waists. This cylinder was connected to a bag that collected all the waste. That was the first NASA toilet. Comfortable and cheap. NASA also tried to experiment with astronauts' diets. It was all about slowing down the digestive process and prolonging the time between eating food and drinking water to produce waste. One of the astronauts, John Glenn, tried this method out. His flight around Earth lasted about five hours. A special diet and medication allowed the astronaut to avoid the call of nature for a relatively long time. He did his business right before re-entering the atmosphere. When scientists analyzed his waste, they found out that its volume was 35% more than the average person's bladder could hold at maximum capacity. But the astronaut had no complaints about his condition and he said the flight had been quite comfortable. I know that now when astronauts spend time inside a space station or a spacecraft in outer space, they sometimes wear their spacesuits for up to nine hours. It means that using the regular toilet on board isn't really an option. The solution to this problem is simple. Diapers. They are more advanced than the ones sold on Earth, of course, with a special absorbent sewn into the fabric. It can keep an astronaut's body dry for a long time. As you already know, I'm a high school teacher. If we went with my students on a school excursion to the International Space Station, the first question they would ask would probably be, Tom, where's the restroom? Well, of course, they would be also excited to learn about the cosmos, but it turns out that using a restroom in zero gravity might be quite a challenge for which one needs to be prepared. If you take a hose in your backyard and start watering your flowers, the water comes out in a solid stream. The gravity captures it and falls where you aim. And in space, as you know, there's almost no gravity. So the water that comes out of the hose keeps flying in the same direction. And if you have to hit a precise target, it's even more difficult. The stream can break into droplets. They will start bouncing off the walls, going down and flying up. So if you're trying to use a regular toilet in space, you would be surrounded by flying droplets. The solution to this problem is to create a force that will attract the waste. If not gravity, then vacuum. Like the one we have in airplane toilets. After pressing the flush button there, you always hear a humming sound. That's the fan that starts pumping the air out of the waste tank. When the pressure is low enough, the hole in the drain opens and all the waste is instantly pulled down. And this is how the space toilet works at the International Space Station, where you have to create such vacuum from the very beginning. This way, the hose water will form a stream, not because of gravity, but the air pulled inside by a fan. Oh, and Regular toilets won't do. If you need to use the bathroom on the ISS, you need to take a hose and turn the toilet on with a button. The fan inside will start spinning, pulling in the air. You'll do your business essentially into a vacuum cleaner. There's a unique funnel shaped hose end so that both men and women can use the toilet. A suction air stream picks up all the droplets and directs them into the tank. Then comes the whole waste cleaning system with many filters and chemicals. There's also a tank of powerful acid. It's there to dissolve any solid formations in the waste. 
Otherwise, they can clog the filters and valves and complex systems and cause a breakdown. A leaky toilet is a very unpleasant thing when you're locked in a tight space without gravity. That acid can easily dissolve even some metals. That's why space toilet materials are made of special titanium alloys, super resistant and very expensive. After being cleaned, the waste gets turned into drinking water. It means that with time, you'll turn it into the garbage again and the cycle will repeat and repeat all over. Don't worry, the purification system works exceptionally well, so there's no harm in drinking the water. And your coffee also won't taste any worse. Things are a little more complicated if you run to the toilet for number two. Then, just like on Earth, you'll have to lift the toilet lid first. At this point, the same fan as in the previous case turns on. It should already be working to prevent bad smells. Then it would help if you sat on the toilet. And here's another challenge. It's hard to do it in zero gravity. So there are straps for your feet and handles to hold on to. The fan does a job and your business goes into the waste tank. Paper and tissues go in there too. Each portion of solid waste then goes into a bag and gets sealed. And then the system sends these waste bags to a special canister. These canisters are stored on the ISS until a cargo spacecraft arrives there. The astronauts receive food and water supplies and scientific equipment. Then they load the cargo spacecraft with canisters of human waste and other garbage. After that, it undocks and prefers to return to Earth. But since cargo spaceships burn up entirely due to friction against the air in the upper atmosphere, all the waste gets disposed of before reaching the planet's surface. Another option astronauts have is to throw the canisters with waste directly into the open space. Earth's gravity eventually attracts the containers and they too burn up in the atmosphere. Currently, NASA is developing a system that could recycle waste of number two into water. After all, water is a precious resource on the International Space Station. So the space toilet, which is a little thing about the size of a scooter, costs around $23 million. That includes manufacturing and a dozen years of development. And this price doesn't even include the delivery to the International Space Station. For that money, you could buy a Bugatti Veyron, the most expensive car in the world, or something similar. Or a private jet, for example. Or you can become an island owner. You can even buy a few of them for that money. But okay, let's get back to space. The journey starts at the launch pad. The rocket that will later deliver the cargo to the ISS is assembled. Ignition! The rocket engines turn on. They burn hundreds of pounds of fuel every second. The rocket goes up, and when all the fuel is burned, the rocket's first stage undocks. It returns to Earth and makes a soft landing. The booster can be used again after refueling. Once the booster is undocked, the rocket's second stage fires the engines. More fuel is burned so that the rocket can reach the ISS altitude of about 250 miles above the sea level. Once in orbit, the cargo spacecraft docks with the ISS. And voila! The space toilet is delivered. But it costs about 50 million to launch a booster rocket like Falcon 9. We also plan to send people to Mars and the trip will take them about 7 months. So we should create a comfortable bathroom for the astronauts, probably. <laughs> the design of the 23 million toilets is bound to be improved. Let's wish the engineers to make it smaller and lighter, so this way it uses less space and saves more fuel. Thank you for watching today, Brightsiders. And remember, let's learn something new every day together with Brightside. It's probably one of the worst nightmares for an astronaut to float away to outer space without any hope to return. Just imagine slowly moving away from the International Space Station into an endless black void because of some accident, somewhere where there's absolutely nothing but a cold vacuum. 
Fortunately, you still have an opportunity to survive. Let's have a detailed look at the moment when this can happen. So, you're on the International Space Station. It's now at an altitude of about 250 miles in the upper layers of the atmosphere. It's important to mention that it's not just hanging out there in space. Earth's gravity is constantly pulling on the station. Not to fall, the station needs to fly around our planet at a speed of about 17,000 miles per hour. That speed is fast enough to help the station fight the planet's pull. But on the ISS, when you go into outer space, you don't feel this speed. It seems to you that you're floating in one place, watching Earth spin. But there's still a lot of space debris that moves in the opposite direction. From the point of view of a person on the ISS, the speed of these objects is incredibly fast. You put on a spacesuit. It has oxygen supplies and is equipped with a water compartment so you can drink during the mission. So, you're about to walk into space. First, you need to go through a special door called an airlock. Once you're inside, you see that there are two doors here. You enter and close the first door to block access to the space station's oxygen. Then you open the door leading to space. What you're about to do is called a spacewalk. There are several reasons why you might be in outer space right now. You may be conducting scientific experiments to find out how different things behave in space. Also, you can be testing new equipment, sensors, and other high-tech gizmos. Another reason might be the repair of failed parts or routine maintenance of the International Space Station. Before taking a step into the void, you attach your spacesuit to a rope connected to the body of the ship. You can also fasten small cables to your tools, such as a screwdriver or a wrench, so that you don't lose them. You push off the ship and experience a feeling similar to swimming underwater. By the way, before going out into a zero-gravity area, astronauts train inside a huge swimming pool. You hold on to the parts of the ship and head to the place that needs to be repaired. Let's say you need to tighten a small screw. One astronaut once said that any work in outer space is difficult. You're wearing a huge suit that slows down your movements and makes you clumsy. It also makes your skin itchy. The work can last up to several hours. During this time, you sweat a lot. One of the spacesuit filters may be broken. In this case, all the fluid released by your body can spread all over the suit and reach your face. Your eyes may start watering. Tears will make your vision blurry. As you see, dozens of dangers are lurking out there in open space, and there are no clear instructions on how to deal with most of them. Anyway, you're tightening the screw, but something goes wrong. The wrench jumps out of your hand, and the screw flies out of the hull of the huh. ship. You try to catch it and accidentally push off the station. You manage to grab the screw, but your body is already flying away. You have nothing to hold on to, but you have the rope. And oh no, <gasps> it's not tied to your spacesuit anymore. You've attached it incorrectly. Now you're not just flying away from the station. Your body is also spinning. The views of blue earth and black space switch in front of your eyes. You can't stop. Fortunately, the cable is not the only safety measure. Your spacesuit is equipped with a safer. Simplified aid for EVA rescue. This is a backpack with fuel that works like a jetpack. You activate the backpack and it levels your flight. You stop spinning and calm down a bit. Now, you know exactly where the ISS is located. Next, you have to choose the direction manually and fly up to the station very carefully. The safer releases gas from small tubes, and this makes you fly forward. Using the safer control panel that looks similar to a joystick, you can change the direction in which the gas is released. This way, you'll steer your spacesuit. Make sure the station is in your line of sight. Press the joystick to activate the tubes, but take your time. You have to stabilize your forward movement. Pressing the wrong button can cause you to spin again, and this will reduce your chances of returning. Each astronaut spends many hours in a virtual reality simulator that makes them feel like being in outer space. So know how to control the safer. You're approaching the station at a slow pace. Don't let the backpack speed you up. If you start to accelerate, you need to point the tubes in the opposite direction to slow yourself down. If you fly too fast, you can crash into the station and damage the spacesuit. You've finally arrived at the ISS. You need to cling to something and move toward the airlock. You feel as if you're climbing a mountain underwater. You get to the airlock. Phew! Well, let's go back in time to the moment when you were flying away from the ISS. So, you tried to use the backpack to level your movement. You're nervous and can't calm down. You randomly press the joystick and chaotically direct the tubes in different directions. A few minutes pass. You haven't come closer to the station. 
and the fuel in the safer has run out. Now, you're even more nervous. Let's go back in time again. You float away from the ISS, then use the safer and slow down the rotation speed of your body. Now you're facing the ISS. You approach the station with slow but steady thrusts. Everything is going well, but at one moment, you notice some movement. This is a small piece of metal from an old satellite. It crashes into the safer and slices through the backpack. Fuel starts leaking out into space. You start spinning again because of the impact. You don't understand which way you are moving. All you need now is to take a deep breath and use the remaining fuel to stop. Done. You're floating without rotating. There are no instructions and protocols that will help you get out of the situation. You're moving in outer space and can control this process. To return to the ISS, you need to push off something. Fortunately, you have time to think about what to do next. Your spacesuit has oxygen reserves that are enough for several hours. Also, you have water. You can drink it through a small rubber straw attached to the inside of your helmet neck ring. You're the first human in history who got into such a situation. But this doesn't mean there's no chance of survival. If you could throw something to the side, it'd set you in motion. For example, if you had a heavy wrench, you could throw it in the opposite direction from the ISS. This way, you'd launch yourself toward the station. But unfortunately, you have nothing to throw. You have your broken safer, but you can't remove it without another person's assistance. You enjoy the beautiful view of Earth and try to breathe as slowly as possible to save oxygen. It seems there's no chance left for you. But at this moment, other astronauts call you using the radio. They see your location and are going to save you. Your colleague is heading in your direction. She's attached securely to two long cables. She's going to give you one of them when she reaches you. Using the safer, the astronaut flies in your direction. She's very close. Finally, she slows down and grabs your hand. She unhooks one of the cables from her spacesuit and attaches it to yours. Using the cable, you approach the station. At this moment, a rusty bolt flies by. The main danger is that space debris can break through your spacesuit and tear the rope. You accelerate and reach the airlock. And then, you open the door and dive inside. One of the most dangerous space missions has been completed. Theoretically, there's another way to save you. A spacecraft delivering food and air supplies to the ISS can pick you up and bring you back to the station. But this mission is even more difficult, as it requires a very precise route calculation. If something goes wrong, the spaceship can kick you. In this case, you will fly away at high speed. You can travel for several hours until you run out of oxygen, or a piece of space debris destroys your spacesuit. Fortunately, all astronauts are well-trained and experienced enough to avoid such accidents. It's September 1977. You're playing one of the first video game consoles released in North America. You step outside and see the whole neighborhood waiting for Voyager 1 to launch. It's a super sunny day, so you squint a little, trying to see what's happening. You live in the neighborhood right outside the launching station. You get yourself some food and watch the Voyager take off into space. You're so impressed, you decide to dedicate your career to working with NASA. 35 years later. You're now a senior official in NASA, specializing in Voyager 1. It's 2012, and you're sitting in the control room with your colleagues. Everyone is staring at their computer screens as they work on the Voyager. You're sitting on the top, overlooking everything and making sure all systems are in check. This day is special, as Voyager 1 is about to exit the heliosphere, which is a science word for the outer shell of our solar system. It's a bubble of space affected by the solar wind, which comes from the sun. By 2021, it got 14 billion miles away from Earth, which is equivalent to 153 astronomical units from the sun. One astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the Earth. The craft was originally meant to fly by Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, and toss itself from one planet to another with the use of their gravitational pull. Everyone is impatiently waiting for it to exit the heliosphere. Three, two, one, and it's officially out. All systems are normal and functioning. You praise your team for doing an excellent job. With Voyager 1 reaching this far, there's still tons to explore in outer space. 
You were once a young adult, watching the craft launch outside your neighborhood. And now, you're the main person in charge of the operation. Nine years later. Since Voyager 1 left the heliosphere, you've been checking up on it every now and then, making sure all systems and functions are in order. It's been sending back measurements of the interstellar medium. It's the area between the stars of our galaxy, consisting of ionized materials. Ionized is basically a simple version of a molecule or substance. The interstellar medium is an electrically charged state of plasma, or ionized plasma, and is very unstable. It's like going from lightning in a thunderstorm back to calm rain in a matter of seconds. The plasma up there is different than the plasma on Earth in that it's difficult to filter out. There are around 0.06 atoms for every cubic inch in the interstellar medium. The air we breathe on Earth has billions of atoms. By measuring the plasma in the interstellar medium, we can further understand the behavior and structure of chemicals and gases. It's possible that the oxygen we know and love on Earth is different than the ones out there. One of your main tasks is to learn more about how the solar wind from the sun and interstellar medium interact with each other to create the heliosphere. So, after doing some routine checkups and other maintenance work on Voyager 1 from the control room, you notice something strange coming from the screen. You sit in front of the computer, crunching the numbers of the plasma vibrations and convert them into an audio file of about 3 kilohertz. You click on it and listen to an eerie, subtle hum. You and your team are surprised that these vibrations occurred in such a small frequency. Given that space is massive, something like this might mean life on other planets. Everyone else at the station rushes to the control room to listen to that sound from outer space. It's monotonous and faint, but it's definitely coming from outside the heliosphere. You run the numbers over and over to make sure it's not a fluke, but it's on point. You make sure your team doesn't spill the beans to anyone outside until everything is known and clear. You get into beast mode with work and try to catch the sound again, and it remains. You can't sleep trying to think of something that could be producing this hum. A few days pass by, and the sound is pretty consistent. If there was some life out there trying to communicate with you, then surely it would have said something that can be deciphered. You analyze the audio files once again, trying to see if it's some phonetic language you don't know. You call in a linguist to see if she can make something out of it. You and the squad gather around, waiting impatiently for some answers. After a while, she believes that it might be someone out there communicating with us, but the only way to find out is by sending something back to them. You arrange a meeting with your team and try to figure out what message you can send. After much thinking and lots of coffee, you decide to send them one phrase in English. Who are you? You send out the signal through Voyager 1 and wait for any changes in the hum, but you don't get anything straight away. It may take some time for a response. You wait all night and still there's nothing. It's starting to look like there isn't anything out there. For the next couple of days, you keep sending out phrases for anything to pick up. Since space is a vacuum, sound waves can't travel. So sending out voice messages on a large speaker won't work. You locate the source of the humming and aim for it when sending the audio file. Every day, you send something different, but still, you don't hear anything from them for a week. It seems that intelligent life in the distant world isn't real. The areas between the star systems and a galaxy aren't necessarily a complete vacuum. That's where the interstellar medium is. It contains gases, dust, and cosmic rays, which are energy particles. After many months of this constant humming being produced, you still try to figure out what's going on. You sit there, remembering the time when the Voyager was first launched. You remember running outside after playing some video games. You couldn't see properly because of the sun, and you freeze in your spot and have a eureka moment. You go through some notes taken in the past. The answer was in front of you all this time. Every now and then, the sun sends a burst of energy that causes the plasma of interstellar space to vibrate. Scientists can measure the frequency of waves when the plasma vibrates to show how close they are to each other. 
and on the day when the hum was delivered, there were some irregular frequencies coming from the sun. So that hum might have been the plasma vibrating in a weird way because of the sun flares. But these low-level vibrations last longer than quick jumps and spikes. They're fainter. You run the tests again and find out that it's not some intelligent life forms out there trying to talk to you. It's the little vibrations caused by sun flares. You notify your team about this breakthrough and everyone's celebrating. But after all these tests and research, you still don't know why plasma mm. in the interstellar medium vibrates in such a way. Those answers will have to wait. 2027. It's been 50 years since the launch of Voyager 1. You're way into your senior years and just retired from NASA. You have many scholarships in your name and programs for young people who want to learn about space and science. You go back to the control room once more, where you thought you had discovered intelligent life on a distant world. Then you remember all the good times you had. You say goodbye to everything, knowing that this is Voyager's final moments. It was built to last up to 50 years. After that, it'll just be a floating object in the vastness of space. It's already surprising to know that this is Earth's most distant object from us. But it's time to let others take your place. You shut off the lights and close the door. The Voyager makes one last beep before eternal silence. There's a giant ghostly hand that stretches across space. Its eerie fingers are reaching for a glowing red cloud that looks like molten space lava. Although it looks like a scene straight out of a sci-fi movie, it's 100% real. The hand was formed after an enormous star collapsed in a huge supernova explosion. The boom created a new star that is bursting with energy. The energy given off by the star is so big that it caused debris from the explosion to swirl around it. This is what created the supernatural-looking hand. The hand is so big that it stretches a colossal 150 light-years. As for the lava-like structure it's reaching for, that's actually a huge gas cloud. So while it looks spooky, it's completely harmless. And you can go to sleep tonight without worrying about a giant ghostly space hand scooping you out of bed. There's a bizarre star hidden in the depths of space that seems to randomly flash on and off. It's known as Tabby's star, and its light dims at super irregular intervals for really odd lengths of time. There have been so many theories about what's causing this, from meteor showers to outer space interference. The comet shower idea was quickly debunked. Dust from comets, which would block the light, goes away after a couple of months. Tabby's star fades slowly over decades, so the timing just doesn't add up. It can't be down to planets either, as no planet is big enough to block that much light from a star. After years of speculation, scientists have finally found an explanation for the strange phenomenon. The dimming and brightening are actually a result of space dust. A ring of dust surrounds the star, which often temporarily blocks its light. On day 8 of its mission in 2019, China's lunar rover discovered something really strange on the far side of our moon that caught the attention of the entire world. While navigating a path around a bunch of lunar craters, it spotted something really weird lurking inside one of the moon's holes. It was a colored substance, just like gel, that we'd never encountered before. The curious material was a rich dark green color and glistened like diamonds. After a year of analyzing the foreign substance that measured 20 inches by 6 inches, the scientists finally came to a conclusion. The glistening effect seems to come from glass. In space, it usually appears as a result of lunar impact melts. This means that it's most likely from a comet or rock that has hit the moon and melted upon impact. But while it's likely that the strange substance is just melted rock, scientists aren't 100% sure. This is because the pictures were captured under bad lighting conditions, and there were a bunch of other factors that badly impacted the quality of the images. So, the jury is still out on this one. There's a huge space cucumber floating through the galaxy, and no one really knows where it came from or why it's there. Okay, it's not exactly a cucumber. Or a pickle. It's more likely a super elongated rock. Scientists think it may be longer than half a mile, but only 540 feet wide. 
It's traveling so quickly that there's no way it's bound by our sun's gravity, meaning that the strange object was formed somewhere outside of our solar system. We don't even know how long it's been wandering through space. It's estimated that it entered our solar system during the Victorian era, but who knows where it had traveled before then. For years, we've been told there are eight planets in our solar system. Nine, if you count Pluto, which got kicked out of the club some years ago. But that might all be about to change. There may be an enormous secret world lurking in the midst of our system, which scientists are calling Planet Nine. This undiscovered planet could be way out past Neptune. There are seemingly unexplained clusters of orbits there, and this hidden ninth planet would explain this. The planet, if it exists, would be 10 times the size of Earth, take at least 10,000 years to orbit the Sun, and would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. This is why it's been so tricky to identify, as it's almost impossible to take a picture of. In 2019, 30% of the area that the planet is likely to be in had been searched. It will take at least another two years to cover the remaining area. In the meantime, we'll be waiting on the edge of our seats. Mm, no. Strange radio waves are beaming down on Earth, and scientists are baffled. These fast radio bursts are sudden, unexplained, and last just milliseconds. We first picked up the weird signals in 2007, and scientists have been scratching their heads ever since. They appear to be coming from outside the Milky Way, millions of light years away. For us to pick them up from that far away, they must be emitting more energy in a fraction of a second than the Sun does in 80 years. Most of these signals only came once, which would have made identifying them much easier, until this all changed in 2017. In August, a signal was picked up that repeated 93 times, ruling out speculation that the signals were being caused by random one-off events. To this day, we still don't know what's causing the signals. Back in 2014, NASA captured a surprising picture of the sun that showed that it might like to play dress-up. A brilliant storm of magnetic fields caused the sun to look like a flaming jack-o'-lantern. Even weirder is that the image was captured on October 8th. It was possible because of something called active regions. These are basically areas of the sun that have greater levels of light and energy. This is what gives the flaming look in the images. The light forms two eyes, a nose, and a wide, jagged, smiling mouth. Fortunately, this look was just a coincidence, and there isn't a giant pumpkin-carving enthusiast lurking in the depths of space. Hey, I want to know, is this a trick or treat? Space fans spotted what appeared to look like a spoon on the surface of Mars. It was half covered in dust. They noticed it after images from a Mars rover had been released. As spooky as the suspicious silverware may sound, it was just a trick of the light. The spoon is just a regular old rock, albeit in a slightly odd shape. The play of shadows in the photo made the object look even more spoon-like. Maybe there's a dish nearby that the spoon ran away with. A cosmic eyeball floating somewhere among the stars is no regular-sized eye. It measures an incredible 660 miles across. One of Saturn's moons, Tethys, has become a bit of a celeb to space fans. The spherical moon sports a large crater that makes it look exactly like a giant interplanetary eyeball. There's even a set of peaks inside the crater that look like an iris. Saturn has a gang of 60 moons in total, and Tethys isn't the only one that looks like a random Earth object. Prometheus looks like a potato, Atlas resembles a pita bread freshly served from a Greek restaurant, and Mimas even looks like some villain spacecraft. And then there's this. There's a giant cat's eye right in the middle of space. Its official name is NGC 6543, but that's kind of long and boring, so most people call it the Cat's Eye Nebula. And it's actually one of the first nebulas to have ever been discovered. Like other nebulas, it was formed by a star that shed its outer layer of gas. The gas floated off and produced this amazing and intriguing structure. The star fires off this layer of gas every 1,500 years. Each time it does this, it creates a spectacular new dust shell. Hey, don't get me started on gas. The most expensive stuff in the universe! Yeah, grandiose. It's called antimatter. 
Its existence was first theorized in 1930, when the electron was discovered. Scientists thought it might mean the exact opposite should exist too, and they called this hypothetical particle positron. Later, antipods of other elementary particles, protons and neutrons, were proven to exist as well. Morons came later. <laughs> when a particle and its evil twin collide with each other, they disappear, releasing literally tons of energy. 10,000 times more than a nuclear reaction does. But there's a catch. It takes about 100 billion years to create just one gram